This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, I have an extra, extra special guest. My friend Howard Lindzen is a guest. This is a little um, off of our regular format, only because Howard and I know each other for, for forever, and less than a guest doing a Q&A is just kind of me goofing around with Howard and having a conversation. Um, Howard has had like really this shockingly blessed career. Um, he launches Wall Strip in the early 2000s, and before you know it, he's in the middle of a bidding war with a bunch of different people, the street.com and CBS wanting to buy it. He rolls that cash into his next venture, which uh, becomes a wildly successful angel fund, um, which now is in its fourth edition. He was a pre-IPO investor in companies like Facebook and Twitter. Literally the first check-in to Robinhood, uh, which went public in 2021 at about a $34 billion dollar Valuation, so you can imagine that first check uh, multiplied uh, a little bit from from 2014 or so. Um, I know him from uh, Lindsay Palooza from his early uh, media work. So uh, strap yourself in for a fun conversation about what it's like to be at in the room where it's happening. To quote Hamilton, but to be at the intersection of media and finance and technology uh, as the world is blowing up. I I thought this conversation was fun and fascinating, and I think you will also. So with no further ado, my discussion with social leverages, Howard Lindzen. Hello, Barry. So what do you think of these digs? Pretty nice. They're better than mine. You know, Canute is a like um, MacGyver of sound. Uh, he he's my producer. Went to school together at ASU, mm-hmm. and we have this a room like this, no light. Everything's padded. It's all right. about sound. This is this, this is, is nice. professional. First of all, everything at Bloomberg, the equipment is just like the best of the best. The people are great. They don't fool around. The only thing I'm waiting for in the studio is a robotic camera so we could do little video clips. But, yeah, I think video... But that's coming also. So All right, awesome. If it's interesting and cool and cutting edge, these guys are right right on it. So let's talk a little bit about your background. I, I've known you for forever. Uh, and over the course of most of that time, your work has really operated at the intersection of finance and media. How did those two interests combine? How did that come about? Well, they came about because the internet did its thing, you know. I right. think they ca- they call it Web two. That's when I'm very much not a, a technical person. Mm-hmm. The I grew Wait, up. Wait, I thought it was Web three. No, oh, that's they the call it, now. They call yeah. the now they call it Web three. Uh huh. But back what, in the two thousands, back in the two thousands, we were coming through that nasty. I wasn't um, involved in tech back then, but you know, by oh five, uh, people thought you know. We were in a, everything was real estate, but in uh, late 05, early 06, YouTube came on the forefront mm-hmm. and I saw YouTube and I'm like, this is for whatever reason that was, there was many competitors or a hundred YouTubes, but you know, the YouTube and its ilk, uh, as soon as I saw YouTube, everything changed for me. Really? Yeah. And you know, before that, obviously the Apple store, my first walking into an Apple store and seeing the uh, iPod. And being able to play with it inside the store, so that was like oh one oh two, right. but that was more hardware and music, and not internet related to me, you know, because I I came from the uh, financial background, so mm-hmm. everything was DOS and Windows. Right. So first you have oh one oh two, you have Apple, and they uh, blew out the store model, the retail model, which no one thought. And then you. By the way, the headlines from that era about why the i i Apple Store was destined to be such a failure are just hilarious. Well, because Gateway had failed, like everybody was doing it. Right. And there was no differentiator between Dell, Gateway, HP. Apple was its own animal and they controlled their ecosystem. Very different creature than. Different creature. I didn't know what Apple was, even though, you know, because you in the financial world, you were on DOS or Windows. I was one of the few on a Mac and uh, it was hard slogging. It was tough. Not everything was available. Right. In fact, uh, there was a period of time where it looked like 
um, Microsoft Office wasn't going to be made available. That would have been a, the death blow to Apple. The antitrust case against Microsoft is the only thing that kept Apple alive. They needed a quote unquote competitor. And, and now the two of them are the two Mac daddies in the space. Yeah, I was living in Phoenix in an Apple store open at the Biltmore. And I stumbled across the street, never really an Apple user. Mm-hmm. And it just blew my mind, the store. So, so that raises an interesting question. How does a kid from Arizona, from Phoenix, get interested in venture investing? Not exactly known as a hotbed of early stage tech Correct. companies. Well, I'd have to go further back, but it's okay. We, you know, I grew up in Toronto mm-hmm. and I grew up, I was born in 65. And so in my formative years, you know, there was TV, there weren't really great video games, Mattel right. and television, Coleco. But, you know, in my, when I'm 15 years old, Second City Television, you, comedy Hilarious. was the, right. in the water. Huge. Much and, like Chicago. And, and Canada was a giant feeder <laughs> into the U.S. Martin. Sure, go down the list of all yeah. the great so I comedians. I grew up watching them yeah. live do stand up at Yuck Yucks. So there was um, in Jim Carrey. There was a chain. So much like, you know, you went to Stanford and got into Facebook, you know, you went uh-huh. to work in tech in this generation in 2000. I mean, sorry, in 1980, I was 15 years old. I'm sneaking into comedy clubs watching, you know, Jim Carrey and Dave Thomas and, you know, rain, like everybody could show up on a night. Here in New York, I went to the 1130 show at Comedy Cellar. Who'd you see? Uh, nobody famous, famous. Who was funny? I don't care who was famous. Who's funny? You know, I don't even remember their name. There was only one out of six that I thought were funny. Really? But you go at 1130 that's here. That's a bad hit to rate. hopefully Although that's a Tuesday a, night. That's a But you hopefully story. go that late show to see maybe a Chris Rock or somebody shows up to practice. Yeah, sometimes. So in, in 1980. He just put out a new show, so he's off the market for a while. Good point. So in, in 1980, I would go to these clubs and that was who my idols were. And I was just, you were, Second City was on television. So, mm-hmm. so I had the comedy bug and you had Johnny Carson. Those were like the shows that right. a, a weird kid would How watch. did that lead to Wall Street? No, it, it long. And then you take a break. I moved to Arizona, go to ASU. Uh-huh. Uh, from to, Toronto. Yeah. From to Toronto. I run away from home. I've had it with this cold and yeah. the snow. I'm going where the sun shines Correct. and don't care about anything. Made that move. Loved Arizona. Golf. Cycling. Obviously the weather. I, I go to ASU, do my MBA. And I graduate in uh, 19, the middle of the a pretty bad recession, the SNL crisis. Uh, so I got my That's MBA. That's like the early 80s, right? Mid 80s? Late, no, it was the late. SNL crisis. Charlie Keating. Oh, so, so late it was the 80s. SNL boom. Yeah, yeah, 90. And Gulf War breaks out. Right. And pretty 91, bad recession. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's when I started in business and became a stockbroker. And I on, did not know that about you. You became who, who you a broker for? It was the print. It was called the principal Epler, Garen, and Turner. Okay. So it was a little regional, you mm-hmm. know, and they all got rolled up. I think eventually it's Re- Dane Rauscher, which is now right. Royal Bank. Like it's, you know, everything got rolled up. I got, I learned how to sell. Pat Ryle was my first mentor. Uh, you know, it was back then you wore a suit. Right. You went into work. You go to Nordstrom's. You get a suit. Smile and dial. Smile and dial. Yeah. You know, cre- uh, I worked car- with those guys. Yeah. And you just had. There was no software. There was no. Uh, you know, you just ask for a Quotron. They're like, what do you need a Quotron for? Yeah, Get on the, the phone. F- so that was my first real job, but I needed to do a job to just stay in the United States. Oh, really? <clears throat> and so even with my master's degrees, you know, back then I needed to figure out how to stay in the U S. So I became a stockbroker. Anyways, one of my cold calls became a home run. So you smiled and dialed. What do you mean? One of your cold calls became a home run. Who, who was So, this you know, I'm a, I, this, by the way, I thought I knew your origin story. No, this is the real one. This is this is the Mandalorian. We're going pre Boba Fett. I'm, <laughs> if it's I'm going okay, way back because you have to know because it was really yeah. you make your own luck and everything's a cold call. So, you know, I'm smiling, dialing. There's no internet to search wealth, and so right. you open the local business paper, and there's this kid smiling, holding a, a squeeze like a product called the Grip, and I figure he's got money, so I dial the guy. He goes, "Yeah, come on down." And I go on down. He pitches me. Right. So I'm, you know, I got Help my MBA. Raise money. I want to do the next grip. He goes, I need 25 grand to make payroll. Anyways, <laughs> he had this stress ball. It was, and you know, I love the, the product. Not the ones where the eyes pop out. No, no, no. It's just, 
I'll get into like the details of it, but anyway, it was a beautifully constructed stress ball called the grip. It was four tension. It was four balloons tension wrapped around this Siberian millet. That's the technical like serious side. Serious piece of hardware. Yeah, serious piece of squeeze ball. Anyways, <laughs> I give him twenty five grand that I don't have. Right. And I ditched did you being give a stockbroker. Did you just commit to the money? I and then you had to go scramble. Oh, I had to scramble. Okay, but you know, call my mom. I'm just trying mom. to get into the details. Now, so where am I going to find twenty five grand from? One of the last conversations I had with my dad, uh-huh. we never uh, got along. But one of the last conversations I had with my dad, I have an MBA. I cut this deal with Mark Scatterday, who's a great founder, and he's a very young guy. He's a fireman who created this product, and I'm like, Dad, I found it. I need twenty five grand to get going. And my dad said, send me a business plan. I'm like, dude, I'm your son. I went to business school. He just wanted you to go through the exercise. And I didn't want to. So uh, I scrambled my own money together. Yeah. And I like your dad's idea. You should have created a business plan just so you have it under your belt. And the, now you want me then not imagine to talk to you how either? successful you would have been. <laughs> no. So obviously I did the business plan. I'm kidding. And, uh, but he didn't give me the money. Right. So you could just go figure it out. And uh, figured it out, gave Mark the money. He went and paid off some bill, his Amex bill. And now I'm an owner of a business that has no money again. <laughs> right. Long story short, the product was a hit. The product's called The Grip. I came in, we built out what was called this ad specialty business, corporate logos, putting it on business. Mm-hmm. And long story short, the product got onto QVC. Oh, no and kidding. we are in the QVC Hall of Fame. There is a QVC ha- Hall of Fame. How many units did this thing sell? Mil- Tens of millions. No, so this put some jingle in your pocket. Yeah, this was our first real hit pre-internet. Ever, did you ever sell that business? No. Or? So the business still exists. Mark Scatterday is a great entrepreneur. Are you He's still built an a owner? huge ad. No. So I was never really an owner. It was an S corp. And this is when you really this goes back to the Rodney Dangerfield back to school right. movie. It's like, get who's going to pay the Teamsters? So we, <laughs> so I learned everything about business from this. We had incredible margins. And software didn't basically exist back right. then. And so you made had a- China or made locally? Made locally in Arizona. Wow. And we would sell tens of millions. Of, you know, we were like the Duraflame. And everybody started copying us. But we had these incredible margins. And that's how I got involved in stocks. Meaning we were making so much money. You had to find a home for it. I had to find a home for it. And luckily there was a bull market. And in this was in the- Early 90s. So there was, you still had almost a decade left before everything. Correct. Um, so indirectly, I became a hedge fund manager to manage our cash at the at, squeeze ball company. At the squeeze ball company, you're managing tens of millions yes. of dollars because it's flowing in that quick. Correct. So the internet in 95 or 96 becomes, I guess, a thing. Right. And I walk into Mark's office. I go, Even Mark. Even before then, but hold. But hold I go, on. Mark, we got to own our domain. And so the grip was G-R-I-P-P. So uh-huh. I remember- the first experience of the internet was that when I tried to buy the domain, it was owned by a penis extension company Get called The here. Grip. They were squatting on The Grip's website. Right. <laughs> so here's what's funny. I didn't want to buy the domain. I'm not paying this guy for the domain. What was I, he asking for it? Do you remember? I, honestly, I don't remember. But I was like, we'll just, we'll just, we'll put three Ps. I don't know what my idea was. <laughs> but anyways, so our product's on QVC. So we now... Um, don't have a domain name. And QVC, we're like a home run product on QVC. Who's our customer? 70-year-old women buying stress balls for, you know, uh, therapy, you know, squeezing right. and, you know, whatever they were selling it as, women right. were buying it. Good for-, for uh, And so QVC would call us and go, we have hundreds of complaints from old women that are going to a website to buy your product. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I learned the internet. Now, oh that's a good God. origin story. That's so that hilarious. is how I got into tech and knew what the internet was. And then I didn't do the internet again until 2006. So Wait, 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 wait. Roll back. We're going we're gonna to not skip that decade. <laughs> so you learned the lesson about a domain squatter. Own your own domain. Master of your domain. But, but you did. Were you master of your own domain? Always. You learned so, that early. You have to but master your did domain. did you not stop and think, hey, there's some money to be made in grabbing some domains. This guy did it to us. Let's now own taxi.com or there was no Netscape com. browser. That's how early. Oh, Remember, the Netscape really? browser wasn't 96, until 99 or. Yeah, no, the, the IPO was oh, 96. Oh, okay. Because I remember. So then it was right on the cusp. I remember being on a trading desk and not being allowed to trade it. Ritholtz, you're a newbie. Don't, don't touch that IPO. Correct. So, so, 
So, and my genius, because again, I'm not an internet kid. I'm a comedy kid. And I'm like haphazard VC, not haphazard hedge fund. Like I'm a haphazard VC. I mean, I didn't set out in life to be a hedge fund guy. Our business turned me into a hedge fund. I didn't set out to be a venture capitalist. I was an entrepreneur, but it so, gave me so access. That- so, sorry, to go back to those 10 years, I am now, um, my big idea of the internet, and a lot of people know this story in general because it happened to a lot of hedge funds or people, is like, internet's stupid. Uh, no one really is using it other than to, you know, to swear at people. It's kind of like pre-Twitter. Nobody uses it except to, like, talk sex and check the weather. So... You know, if anybody's going to use the internet, the FedEx is going to benefit. So through that whole late boom, I was the guy like not owning internet companies, but but looking at logistics. And yeah, like, like thinking like, and FedEx would go down every day for some reason. You know, so I you, really got that first trade horrifically that, wrong. If you took that to its natural conclusion, then you're owning things in the '90s like. Cisco and Juniper Systems and AMD yeah. and Global Crossing, which is you know, the blocking and tackling of the internet, but you had to have at least a little tech, you know. My problem was I grew up in Toronto. I'm conservative. I'm like very like fundamental and I didn't understand the internet. Not conservative politically. No, no, no. I mean, you don't strike me as somebody risk averse. Very. Really? Yeah. We'll talk more about that in, in, in a little bit. So... The rest of the 90s, you just sat on your hands? Yeah, sat on my hands, missed the internet, boom, but then and also bust. didn't get killed. Right. So you come out of the crash. Just hey, hating what? the market. I didn't understand the market. I was What's like, down 81% between friends on the NASDAQ, right? That's yeah. uh, that's not a big deal. Didn't even know the NASDAQ, basically. <laughs> so right? what? when did the idea for Wall Street pop into your head? So, so now the one lucky investment that I made, and it was a dumb investment, much mm-hmm. like you know, the dumb investments people made in 21. So in 1999, uh-huh. I invested in this. Some guy pitches me on a, a series Q or whatever they were doing right. back then of Cars Direct, which was like- I recall that. Cars Direct sure. was like a hot, late stage, end of end of the bubble era where you could sell cars at a loss, but we'll do it in volume. And right, Mary make Meeker, it up a little bit. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so someone pitched me like the Series Q and I was like in cash, right? Like I was missing the whole internet bubble. So I remember saying, yeah, I'll put some money in this. And that was the top. The minute my wire hit yeah. Cars Direct. Done. Now, as an added bonus to invest in Cars Direct, to induce me into Cars they were going to throw in this other internet company. You know, sometimes you like go to the horse races and they give you like, handicapped horse as like an extra for betting on one horse that probably that won't finish the race but, right but so they said what but did they throw in they threw in this company viva.com viva i didn't even look it up so they said listen it's, it's a two for one uh anyways the bubble ends cause direct goes in i the think tank. 10 years later we sold for a few cents on the dollar someone right. bought it but this Viva.com was run by um, Scott Ingram, who's a friend of mine and an LP now, and Boy, Alan I met, Hunter. Did I meet him at your event? Probably one of our events. Anyway, Scott, Viva.com uh, becomes rent, which was uh, means rent. Like it was just, they couldn't, uh-huh. they couldn't buy rent.com during that boom. Right. During the crash, he goes and buys the domain rent.com and builds the largest, you know, kind of rent Apartment marketplace. Finder. And eBay buys it. Oh, for four hundred and fifty million dollars, and you were so a, my you were a seed, my seed. That was seed my investor. first seed win. Wow! By mistake, right? And so I got, of which <laughs> there have been many seed wins. By so mistake, that was right? that gave me my first internet win. And were you like itself. a cap table in, owner or just a rounding error? A rounding error, but for me it was still real, real money. money. So I go, oh, and I became friends. I used to call God, Scott this. Ingram and go how are you still alive? Like I was just like my one internet investment. Right. And he just thought I was humorous, like as a 50 K hundred K investor checking in on my investment. And we would talk about <laughs> right. the a, a internet. Billion dollar company. It's <laughs> yeah. like, how's my 10 grand doing? Yeah. So I was fascinated that a businessman could build businesses on the internet. All and right. so now flash forward to, you know, I'm a hedge fund guy. I hate CNBC. I, I don't have money for a Bloomberg. You know, I'm just a retail Yahoo Finance kind of guy. Right. Hey, it's free. And and E-Trade. And in 06, YouTube comes out. And I have this idea that I'm going to build, going back to my comedy, 
and going back to how I grew up, I go, I'm going to build CNBC on YouTube. Right. That was it. That Meaning was my idea. a satirical take on financial no. television. No. Playing it straight, but I always thought Correct. there was a lot of tongue in cheek in everything you guys did. Correct. Right? It wasn't a straight up. It wasn't Second City. It wasn't supposed to be funny vignettes. You played it straight, but there was a subtext of, hey, this stuff's ridiculous. Correct. The first show. Meaning, I... I, I that's I, what hooked everybody. That's what hooked. But we never got beyond that before CBS bought it. But going back, <laughs> I had this idea. One I, show, sold. Yeah. I cold call Fred Wilson, who I at, didn't know at, at the um, time, Union Square Ventures. Down here in, uh, in New York. Yeah. So I, I used to leave these whack job comments on his blog. He had this blog. And back in the day, blogs had blog roles. Right. You know that. You I were had, an early I, blogger. Big You're picture a had, had comments up until like 09. Finally, I just so gave up. So Fred was like Twitter. Everybody was there talking to Fred. Mm -hmm. And I would leave these whack job comments. Like and, what? Like, uh, like just funny? I can't or? believe you're giving. Yeah, I kind of became the the bouncer at Fred's site. You, you were the motley fool then. Because I was the guy who, who didn't care about venture. I was just there. Can't believe he's sharing all this wisdom about venture. For free. For free. Anyways, I finally pitch him. I, I say, Fred, you're going to be in Phoenix. He's never met me. I said, I'm going to take you to a Suns game. And this is like internet 2005. Right. And Fred was already, I don't Killing think he was it. famous. Oh, five, he was, they had already he wasn't famous. by then. Right. He wasn't famous like he is today. Well, because post.com implosion, nobody cared about Correct. who was a VC, but they had been making money for a while. Correct. They had done um, so many big deals in the first run. Right. And uh, the biggest one being, uh, I'm having a senior moment. But anyways, it'll come to me. I go, Fred, come to the Suns game. I, you know, I'm trying to just become his friend. Right. And he agrees, brings the son, and we go to the Suns game. And, and Joanne, his wife, was like, Fred, you can't just go out with people on the internet. This is not that <laughs> long ago. <laughs> but Fred just, we became friends. I pitch him on this idea. Nobody that, stalks someone for three years to murder them. They normally. But think that, about like Fred and social that. media sure. where we're at today. Yeah. And Think Fred, about how many people you know today from social media. You never would have known it. It's been flipped on its head. Unbelievable. So he comes in, in, he kind of becomes my mentor in that. And I find out that he was street.com's first. I didn't even know this until mm -hmm. after he invested. So luck would have it. Not only did he get my idea to create CNBC on YouTube, he was there when Kramer was building the right. street.com. And that was late nineties. Yeah. Kramer, Kramer so, put that out. so Fred, by the way, I have said that the very first financial blog, was Todd Harrison's trading diary. Amazing. That was a real-time series of update embedded in the street.com yep. that, you know, here's a guy who was Kramer Berkowitz's head trader. Yep. I mean, a lot of the best trades that Kramer did as a hedge fund manager, you know, tapping out before everything went to hell in 2000. Um, I think that's Todd saying, listen, every risk measure we look at is terrible. I remember reading this. You got to get out. And he avoided the disaster. Full credit to Harrison on that. But real time, hey, we're put legging into this position. Um, he used to use the bull and bear metaphors. Dude, they, they I got one Twitter. leg in my bear suit. Little Twitter. Right, exactly. And all the comments, it was all live. It was street.com, to give credit, mm -hmm. was the place. Your blogs. Listen, I Josh didn't have Brown, Bloomberg. My partner, Josh Brown, calls the street.com the Motown of finance. Like yeah. Barry Gordy. And everybody who came out of Motown, I could give you a list of 100 people you know in finance today yeah. that trace their roots back to street.com, present company included. Yeah. And I was a customer and I was a Kramer fan at the time because mm -hmm. I came from the street myself. Right. And, and he was running a fund. He was, he was he, very active. It was like, it was real. And so I find out Fred was his investor. I was like, wow. So I got the right investors. Uh -huh. I raised 600 grand for Wall Strip, which is a lot of money. Right. And, Not really. And, and well, at then, Web2 hasn't, wasn't really a thing. 2005? Yeah. So, I mean, back but, then, it was, you know, today, everything is Amazon Cloud. It doesn't take a lot. Right. Back then, you had to have servers, you had to have sure. tech people. You had, like, just building out the back end was a massive And no price. revenue idea. Right. There was no infrastructure for revenue. 
right? There's no ad networks and there was no, so you, you had to Building figure it out as you go. everything from scratch. So when we did an ad, we had to like make the ad, insert the ad ourselves, like be woof. able to track it, be able to bill it. So luck, as luck would have it, the show was a hit. And by hit, I mean not like millions of views because, but in relative terms at that time, if you went to YouTube, it was cat videos. Right. <laughs> And it was people filming their television and getting takedown notices of like Dukes of Hazard or whatever. So the, it, it was just a giant woman, lawsuit. The woman you had as an anchor was yeah. fantastic. Lindsay Campbell. Lindsay was awesome. Yeah. And she went on to go into television. After when that. we sold, Lindsay got a part in the show that was the era show, um, uh -huh. the mob show on uh, HBO. Uh, the Sopranos. Sopranos. She was a teacher in a couple you're, episodes. You're, for early 70s, your memory is really <laughs> terrible. It, you should be a little well, I can't log on the internet to just search IMDb. Basically, <laughs> well, all I can. do is search uh, IMDb. Oh, the, are you on a screen? or are you... It's okay. People, it's, a, it's a thing that mm -hmm. honestly happens uh -huh. that you just tip of your tongue all day long. So I have this to look forward to in 10 years? You do. And by the way, I'm going to have to stand up for the last half of this because I, I feel like I have to pee. Right. So, so Lindsay Campbell, we found, uh, but oh what a, God. what a time this she was. She was great. She was. Talk about all so the, everything lined up perfectly at once. Yeah. And so we had this idea. This is a funny story. So there, Fred was a master and Fred introduced me. This is how the internet worked before the internet. Right. There was no iPhone yet. There was not even, You're still Blackberry five years was really away from coming the, into its own. Right. You're still a few years away. By the way, I have a vivid recollection of Lindsay and a cameraman with her holding a wired mic back to running around lower Manhattan, Midtown, ass throwing the, the mic. Man on the street faces. stuff. Yeah. What do you think of this? And, you know, she's a pretty girl. People were like more than happy to talk to her. Yeah. Guys in suits. We, today we would call them finance bros, mm -hmm. but she would be on Wall Street. So what's going on with the markets? Yeah. And the way we edited show. it was hysterical. That was a show. So, so the idea was we're going to create CNBC on YouTube. Fred invested, handed me a list of 11 people. He said, Howard, he didn't invest. Call these fun. people. Yeah. He said, why don't you call them? Beep, 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 beep. Roger Ehrenberg. Hey, Roger. Hey, Howard. <laughs> I read your blog, blah, blah, blah. Fred, Fred's investing. Uh, if you drop Fred's name, everybody wrote a check. So I go, of course. I didn't know this at the time. So I go, Fred said to give you a call. He goes, yeah, I'm in for 25. Hangs up. Beep, 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 beep. Brad Felt. Hey, Brad. Fred Wilson said I should call you. Sure. 25K. Beep, 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 beep. Anyways, I call Fred back like a day later. Everybody's I go, in. I go, 10 for 11. Okay. Who's the 11th? That's a funny story. So this guy, Mark Pincus, who's gone on to start Zynga uh -huh. and he was an investor in Facebook and LinkedIn. So he partners with Reed Hoffman. Fred is uh, an investor in all his stuff. That, he was a name on the list. So I call, I call Mark Pincus. I'm on a roll. I'm like out of attitude. So I call Mark Pincus, <laughs> picks up and goes, hey, uh, hey, it's Howard. Uh, Fred said to give me your number. I, I do the pitch. He goes, it's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, and then he goes like this, and tell Fred not to give up my <laughs> phone number anymore. It hangs up here. on me. <laughs> so when I call Fred back, <laughs> so I call so Fred back. So not just a no, that's know. a hard no. And anyways, if you know Mark and I do, he's an LP, he's a friend. Yeah. Uh, as much as you can be a friend with Mark, he's a super smart investor and started Zynga. I call Fred back and go, you're, you're a genius. I go, 10 out of 11 people just wrote a check over a StarTech phone call pitch for an internet YouTube company. I go, I don't know what's going on here. And, and I said, but there's this one guy who not only thinks it's the dumbest idea, but told me not to give, he said to you not to give out his phone number anymore. Fred laughed. Just he knew who it was. Yeah, he goes, oh, that's Mark. Don't worry. Anyways, so- Call him back. <laughs> he didn't say call him back. <laughs> but this is a funny Mark story that I haven't told too often is about three months later, we, I never, I didn't know what doc, listen, this was like a loosely, the internet, the deals were not it was the same as they are today. It was, it a, was handshake a handshake deal. Like I'm a try, yeah. like Fred, try, like this was like a two person operation. R read Sebastian Malby's book on, on the power law and venture capital. Million dollar deals were literally done on a handshake. Hey, yeah. I'll come by Monday for a check. We'll have the lawyers get yeah. the documents. It wasn't like a team of staff. There weren't even standard docs. Fred right. was, Fred it was, was everybody like was kind of winging it. Yeah. Fred was the, the, he's the maestro. So I'll trust, you know, I'm going to get to the docs. Anyways, stuff was moving very fast. YouTube's getting sued. We're just 
distributing our video across a hundred of these YouTube channels. Anyways, three months goes in and I get a break. I get like you, New York times, the gray lady is going to do a piece on wall street. You know, we're maybe getting six to 10,000 views an episode, which is not nothing, it's, but it's nothing in today's world, in today's world. But then, Oh yeah. Then no, who was, was getting 10,000 views in a day and yeah, not just 10,000. It was who was watching. Right. That's what I learned about the difference between audience. Right. audience and the right audience. Right. right. And so Fred was, we were all promoting. It was a very cute show, as you know, and I was writing it and starring in it and producing it. And I didn't know what I was doing, but it was the internet. Anyways, but three months go by and, um, you know, we're doing the books. There's no revenue. The books are pretty easy to do quick. And, oh, we burn 30 grand. This <laughs> it's a, it, that's called single entry accounting. <laughs> single Just show entry me what cash you're spending, accounting. No money is coming in. Correct. I was wearing that hat at night. There was not much accounting to do except how many months we have left before right. we have to call Fred for more money. So anyways, 10, you know, I'm doing the books and there's an extra. So we get in the New York times, whatever. And I'm like famous and, uh, there's an extra 10 grand in our account. And I'm like yelling at my team and yelling, Lindsay, did we do revenue that I don't know about? Well, Mark like, just dropped off a check and nobody nev so never bothered to tell anybody. Never told anybody after he knew we were successful, sent him the 10 K. <laughs> <laughs> so I call Fred, I go, this mother, I, you know, I call Fred. Can go, you Who believe is this guy? guy? He's like my so Newman. He was the first He's like my the Newman. round B at the okay. higher valuation. No, I ended up, we ended up selling to CBS long story short a few months later. And he, re I returned multiples on that late right. money and we've been friends ever since. That's hilarious. So he was like my Newman at the time, you know, like in <laughs> Seinfeld. I'd see that check. I go Newman Pinkus. <laughs> so, uh, so, anyways, it was just that's what the internet was. It was very cottagey. It was Web two. So it was hilarious. just coming out of such see, a bear I market. Think of like the seventies and eighties that way. You're telling me even in the two thousands, it was still shockingly rudimentary. Rudimentary. There was no Y Combinator. There was no Texas. There was no way. Wait, to do when business. did Y Combinator come out? Probably seven oh eight. That 09. late. All yeah. right. God. I think. Because, because I, I used to I go remember, to those events. There'd only be 20, 30 people there. I remember the 90s, if you were interested in venture capital and you were on the East Coast, the only way you could learn anything was like Fast Money or, I'm sorry, uh, Fast Company or Wired Magazine, but there was really not a lot of media coverage of what was going on in the West. No, and Jim Certainly, Kramer, to his credit, he used to write at Smart Money Magazine. Right. I was a disciple. And Listen, then Kramer he started was, an internet company. People don't realize. He had an internet for, company. If you're not a fan of Kramer today, I, I can't. Which I'm not. I, I'm not going to argue with you, day. but you have to realize how influential yeah. and important a player he was in the, in the 90s, in the 2000s. He was really... Uh, you know, between between running the hedge fund, Kramer Berkowitz, between launching the street dot com, when nobody really thought, I know, let's do a real time finance site that's actually operated by people running real money, yeah. not just a bunch of ministers without portfolios. Yeah. And all the time dropping in on TV, doing his hits like when he had his finger on the pulse, when he was running money. Uh, he was the man for a long time and now it's a different world. It's a different environment and he's in a different role. But uh, regardless of what you think of him today, you got to give him props for what he did in the he, 1990s. And, he and lit the way and, and Fred has great Kramer stories. Anyways, what made Starks with a uh, wall strip great is, you know, we were doing five, 6,000 views and I had this idea to get Kramer's attention. We would spoof Kramer. Right. Okay. I remember that. Okay. This I is a great story. So that. I, so I go, I said, we can't spoof Kramer. You can't, you can't upset the guy. What we'll do is have our Kramer give cancer and medical advice. So he's going to have a show. Right. He's going to be Kramer, but people will call with medical questions. Oh God. And so we got this method act. Lindsay found one of her friends who's a method actor mm. who looked a lot like Kramer. And right. we said, listen, Go into that room, listen to a hundred hours of, of Kramer, <laughs> be Jim Kramer. And then we're going to create like a set and you're going to like give advice with people calling in for medical, medical problems. Advice. Hilarious. Anyways, he was so mad, Kramer. Oh, he didn't oh, so think about music. No, he doesn't have a sense of humor like, yeah, like that's I fair. do. So anyways, this leads to our acquisition. So 
Kramer so by, wants it, to buy us to get us off the internet. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Street.com calls me after the show and goes, we'll buy you. I'm like, buy me? I don't know I was for sale. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. We had right. no revenue. I had 10 grand showing up in the ether. Right. Uh, we had nothing but expenses, Barry. It wasn't like the, the 90s where you had to build a business like my This was a little bit business. of green mail. This was this like, was really hey, buy silly. us or we'll do another uh, parody. Yeah. This is how I got into VC. So Street Talk kind of says, we'll give you this amount of money. And I say, deal. Like I'm like, I'm like Kramer and Seinfeld. I'm like, right. you spilled hot coffee on me. Don't accept the first offer. <laughs> I'm like, deal, Kramer, you got me. <laughs> so I call Fred Wilson. I go, Fred. I go, you know, Fred's my board. I go, Fred, what do I do? He goes, I didn't know you want to sell. You call them back. And like he, you know, Fred's like, he walked you through what you had to do. Yeah. He says, I guess there's a competitive bidding going on. Correct. Fred, so Fred makes a beep, 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 makes a few calls. Like the next day I'm at CBS. Right. And I have no, you got to understand, you know me, right? (laughs) I'm literally a nobody. Clueless. Clueless. You know, obviously good instincts. I'm not Uh going to completely terrorize myself, but good instincts, great people around me. Right. Lesson number two, you got to know your cap table. You got to build trust. You got to have great people around you. Uh So I made the one call. Fred goes, Howard, you want to sell? Got to have a, if you didn't know you wanted to sell, let's get blah, blah, blah. Next, you know, I'm in CBS's office at BlackRock. This table is big as Bloomberg headquarters. And you got (laughs) Quincy Smith, who's a great guy. Right. Uh, He's running CBS Interactive. And Mike Marquez is a dear friend of mine today. When, When. wasn't Mark, they had already acquired Market Watch by then, right? Yeah, a long time earlier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill Bishop and, and those guys, great guy, newbie. And um, they go, hey, here you want to sell. And I go, I don't even know how to prepare for this, man. I go, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, what's street.com's number? And like, I literally was unprepared like an idiot, for this. Like you no, told I'm them. An idiot. No, I, I made up a number, a little higher. Higher than what they had offered? Yeah. And they go, we'll double it. And I go, deal. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again, I've hit the table. And I'm like, Duh. Kramer, what are yeah. you doing? I have nobody in the Side room with me Kramer. to like stop me. And then I go, but you know what? I, the one thing I said, I go, you know what? Let me call my board. And I remember Quincy, they go, we'll wait. I'm like, I thought I'd have 24 hours. I go, right. we'll wait here. And I'm like, so I, I trample out of the, the, the boardroom. <laughs> I call Fred on my Star Trek. I go, Fred. CBS offered me double what street.com. He goes, well, do you want to do the deal? And I said, dude, I mean, it's a lot of money. It's been six months. Uh, I said, I think I do. We have no revenue. I mean, I don't see how we're going to make this work. Yeah. I'm like, it's a rescue plan before we run out of money. Correct. This was, and, and they have the infrastructure to monetize it if they want to do that. And I, for a minute, think I'm going to be famous. Like right. My in my old think about me coming out of the room. I'm, like, I'm going to be on Letterman. I'm going to have a show. <laughs> right. <laughs> you saw the crappy little website for a barely a seven figures. Where right. I was now an executive at CBS. <laughs> I, right. Yeah. Hilarious. There was like if there was a balloon coming out of my head, I'm like, you this know, is bring it. me green M and M stat. <laughs> so, you, you want the green M and M's out of out yeah. of the. And so I call, I said, Fred goes, walk back in there and you tell them that you won't shop the deal if they add another two, two. Right. And I said, can I do that, Fred? He goes, you (laughs) can up and you walk back. (laughs) (laughs) And I go, okay. And I'm wearing like my Crocs, I think, and some sunglasses. I'm not prepared for this meeting. And I walked back in and I said, listen, I talked to my board and, you know, for an extra two, I won't shop. And they go, deal. And I go, hang on. They go, get the f*** out of our office. <laughs> so that was how my deal with CVS was done. Oh, my, oh my God, God. That's and, hilarious. And literally half my investors had not finished signing their paperwork right. when we returned the money. So it was just, it was so a different era. So they all got era. 3X, 5X, 10X, I had an MBA. Yeah. I was supposed to know what I was doing. I'd like to tell people, you know, people look up to me, you know, but I like to give the honest story is what made that successful? Right idea, uh-huh. right time. I had no ego about the exit that I was building something greater right. than anybody else. I had incredible people around me, Lindsay running the show. Right. She over exceeded anything that you could expect. I found these people on Craigslist, right? right. They were just, and it was a miracle. Craigslist, it was a miracle. which was on the internet. On the internet. So I don't know. It was just one of the greatest, stressful, fun interesting times in my life and i met great people and that's kind of what got me started boy we're out of time 
At right. least you know now how I, I asked one question. The... Thanks for coming. That's all the time we have. <laughs> the sale of Wall Strip, the next step from there, was that social leverage? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. So I sell Wall Strip. I'm working at CBS, and uh, I pitch them this idea, what like my best idea I've ever had. So, you know, there was this moment where I said I was going to be famous, and CBS goes, okay. <laughs> Quincy goes, go meet the TV people. They're going right. to love you. They did not want to meet me. <laughs> so I have this idea for a show yeah. for them because they asked me to pitch them a show. I thought they bought my show. I thought they owned me. So I, right. I, 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 I stay up for three days. I'm writing furiously a show idea. And my show idea is very simple. It's like after, after dark. Whenever a guest comes on Letterman or their after show, that that guest would now come over to this studio, the creepy studio, and there'd be a comedian, and they would just talk about what's in their wallet. You know, the celebrity would talk Everyday about money. Carry, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. There would just be a show about money. Right. Hey, show me your wallet. What credit card do you use? Have you ever been screwed by your financial manager? You know what I mean? If you got to go to Vegas and need 10 grand, how do you do it? Right? It'd be an interesting look sure. into how famous people spend now, money. Now, if you get them to eat hot wings at the same time, that's a show. That's a show. So they threw me out of the building. Get out <laughs> yeah. And that was my end. I was so, the, by that like, day. that was hard. I was done. Clarence Beaks from that point. Right. Who's Clarence Beaks? Trading I was, places. I was collecting a paycheck and no job. Right. And Twitter, you know, in the background, Twitter now starts. And I saw Twitter and I said, this is Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. My first call was to Fred Wilson with Twitter. We were all making fun of Twitter back in the day before iPhone. You right. were, everybody was. I was using it and I was telling people where I went to the bathroom. Hey, I took a pee at this restaurant and the VCs thought I was funny because right. it was really VCs on Twitter at right. the time. It, it was journalists and venture capitalists. That's pretty so much So I went to Fred and I said, Fred, this is Bloomberg. If I, if the president ever, this is like a blog post I wrote, when the president tweets, about the economy, the market will move. And Fred goes, that's very clever. You should start a company. I go, Fred, I'm working for CBS. And that's where stock tweets came out. I went to right. Jack and Ev at the time. And I said, so now at this time, Twitter's pretty small and you're talking about Twitter's Jack very Dorsey. small. Yeah. What, what is there? 50 million people on Twitter? At that no, point? not that not many. Uh, 10, 20 million people. Fred had invested it. I passed on that investment. Good it call. A, yeah. It was a. Uh, you know, I, you could have sold it to some idiot for $44 billion. This show is not Howard's a genius. It's called <laughs> Masters in Business. You have to have losses to become a master. That's so, true. So I. That is very true, young grasshopper. So I go to Jack and Ev and I said, Twitter.finance. This is my pitch to them. I go, Twitter.finance.com. I said, People will talk about stocks on here. And right. they were like, Kumbaya, what about uh, Greenpeace? And all that world. stuff. That's, just, that's Greenpeace Twitter. This yeah. is finance Twitter. And finance Twitter, the original FinTwit idea. And they were like, you should just, you know, we have an open API, which is a trap. Just plug in. Yeah, plug in. So Build course, your entire company on our yeah. continuing goodwill and whim. Correct. So this was uh, not smart by me, but smart. You know, it depends how you look at it. I, You know, some days I love the idea. Some days I'm like, wow. But um, I went back and I said, listen, I got two choices. I can either just give it away for free, which, you know, I started the cash tag dollar sign, right. AAPL, dollar sign R-I-M-M, because my idea was how do you separate people talking about green apples from people right. saying they love the Apple store? The stock symbol. Yeah. Like a hashtag, only a dollar sign. Because people already in finance spoke the language of yeah. tickers. Yep. It was a clever hack uh, and I created it with the team and we just started tweeting with dollar signs and it caught on. Right. So now I had a decision to make because people, because I had sold my last company, all the VCs were like, Howard, what are you doing now? What are you working on? Right. And I'm the idiot that just said, well, this and people, and I said, but I don't know, like, how am I going to make money? You know, I don't really we'll figure control. That out later. Yeah. So I felt trapped to the very things we make fun of other people for is like, and this goes to today's lessons. You know, just because you have a, an idea doesn't mean it should be venture back. <laughs> <laughs> so kids today, that's a lesson for you. Right. Not everything needs venture capital. But at that time, it was nirvana, right? Because yeah. there was just organic growth. Another so rad. very important lesson. Organic growth is growth. Other kind of growth, not so growthy. You, growth when it's buy. organic, right. As it's opposed beautiful. to, well, it worked AI out for today, Uber. chat GPT. Right. Organic That's organic good. growth. The world loves organic growth because it's a mystery. Right. It's a miracle. 
Well, 2006 was a miracle. You have Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, AWS, the coming of the iPhone, the App Store. You know what I mean? Right. This was all to come. Well, we were still well the Black dot-com Barry. crash is, is far enough in our recent history, five, six years earlier, yeah. that uh, some of the wounds are starting to heal. Yeah. People are start the, the market is up off the lows pretty substantially before the 08, 09 crisis. The tech market was, So yeah. people are starting to look around and saying, hey, what's going on out here? But it was organic growth. Mm-hmm. You didn't have to force somebody like a crypto wallet to force feed it down their throat. This right. is the future. It was just happening. Uh, plus, you had all of the late 90s infrastructure build out. Yeah. The miles of fiber optic cable and all of the various um, hardware upgrades w- was just waiting for something to be built on top of it. Web 2.0, as you called it. And these were all those companies that were taking advantage of cheap post-crash prices. Yeah. So the smartest thing I ever did in this where social leverage started is I took everything I made right. and just redistributed it to everybody I saw doing a startup around Just Twitter. every company. You Anything just shot them. that I saw, I wrote a 25. I ran out of money quickly. But I layered the world with my 25 Give us some names that we might be familiar with from back uh, then. Most famous was Golf Now, LifeLock, Buddy Media, Tube Mogul, TicketFly, TweetDeck, Bitly, Samize, Betaworks. Oh, so a lot of these have already had eggs. Ed- Uber. Ed- yeah. So, Uber. Uh, okay. Yeah. So Uber, AngelList, I was an investor okay. in. Okay. So Another. all these things came from me just being in the mix right. and knowing Fred and reading blogs and just being part of the community. Mm-hmm. And I was at the right place in time. This doesn't happen very often. I think the AI, some AI machine experts now are going to be in this place, but right. we, that was organic growth. That was the first real internet. The, the, the internet of 99 was infrastructure and promise. The internet of 05 and 06 was the users mass user onboarding. So you have, you know, as well as I've done, I was supposed to do well. If you were <clears throat> alive and writing checks in 2006 to 2011. Hard not to make money. Correct. So, so remember that as a master's in business lesson, being in the right place at the right time with a checkbook matters. So and that planetary alignment doesn't come along very often. No. How do you recognize, like at the time, are you just spreading the manure, hoping all the plants grow? Or were you thinking, wow, this is a target-rich environment and I got to have a little bit in everything? It's a good question because I didn't have that much money. The idea, and you run out of money fast, even when you're writing 25, 50 K, sure. they add up a hey, fast. 50 checks and you're, you know, that's a million dollars. I was dollars. 50 checks in quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, I was flying to Israel, I did eToro, and I'm, in, and I'm also running stock twits, right. which is also an extra benefit because everybody's pitching me ideas. Right. Okay. You're right in the middle Which of the Which leads flow. to the Robin Hood story later. But so everybody's pitching me ideas. I'm running a company. I'm writing 25K checks. I'm talking to everybody that matters. And there's organic growth, meaning no one was faking it. It right. was just ballooning. Whatever you did had traffic, not fake. It, it may not be lever lasting, right. but it was real. So the name social leverage obviously comes from the people that you met on the first round that you began to socialize with. Suddenly, everybody's in everybody else's deals. Everybody else Correct. is seeing what's going on. So, so how? And six- also, most importantly, the mm-hmm. end of financial leverage. So it was a play on words. Gotcha. Going back to my gotcha. comedy is like, we are coming out of this era where we realize that financial leverage is not a strategy; it's a tool. Okay. So mm-hmm. my play on words here was that social leverage is infinite. You and me doing this podcast, right. me starting my own podcast. This all is leverage from the network. Right. Financial leverage almost brought down the system. So your social leverage is deal flow, connections, Fun. access to start founders, access low to capital, capital right. low capital requirements. Uh-huh. It was just a moment of the opposite of what brought down the system. Right. But no one really dove in. Most people think, hey, you're giving back to social good. I go, no, I'm pro oil. But, uh, <laughs> but so there is people go, oh, I don't want to invest with a guy who's invested in the social good. And I'm like, well, do you drive a car Then shut up? Yeah. But I, I, I by the way, I uh, digression, I don't understand the whole low carbon investments. We're going to not give any money to the carbon producers. Instead, we give money to the carbon consumers. How, how are you moving the needle there? 
if you're against oil and want to see alternatives come up, isn't there a, a better way to do it than saying, we're just going to give money to people who use carbon? Yeah. Right? Well, climate now is a big category for VCs, yeah. and I'm not right. in it, but it's, there's big developments happening. I, finally. I, if you want to invest in alternative right. energy, well, that's, put your money in there because there's a ton of promise that's in that finally space. Gonna but be to a say, thing. Uh, no mobile, we're just going to invest in UPS and FedEx. Amazon. Yeah. You know, uh, this way we'll not spoil the environment is just kind of misguided. Yeah. So social leverage is just a play on words. Right. So, so worked from, well. From, from social leverage, uh, where do you go from there? How, how do you, as a venture investor, how do you think about what you're putting money into? Are you, what, is it about the management team? Is it about the product idea? Is it about the valuation? What What's the decision-making process? It's a great question. Everybody's different. You know, luckily my mentors, <clears throat> Brad Feld, Fred, what, these are like some of the great- Rock stars, yeah. Yeah, rock stars. But By the also, way, I've been begging Fred to come on the show. No BS. Do, seven years. He's like, I don't really do podcasts. I he go, may show up have. tonight at our event. All right, well, I'll corner him. I met him somewhere else. But Howard Morgan shows up, uh -huh. Roger Ehrenberg. So, so I got very lucky because at that time, Remember, you're coming out of a nasty bear market. Yeah. These guys were not so this is like looked 08, upon as and like, beyond. yeah, these people were coming out of getting their ass kicked for five years and right. lawsuits and IPOs that went down 95%. So these were not famous people. These were people that were deemed idiots. Again, didn't, truly not idiots, but you know what I mean? They sure. were out of favor. You're only, you're only as good as your last trade. Correct. So, many so people. these people were beat up, but they were all smart. And they, and my and they had guys, capital. They had capital. They survived. They kept their reputation intact by communicating with their investors. Right. It was a cycle. And they caught the next cycle. Now, right. this cycle, they be, what, what happens to great investors after they go through a cycle? They if they're great, they, they become great it. investors right. because they have memory and they have a new muscle that they learn that markets go down. Right? right? Like. Guess what Fred hates? The stock market. Because he met, you know, he became a VC. He's like, my job is to invest early. And if I have a chance to sell, I'm not going to be greedy. Right. So luckily I had this great group of mentors. And like you, they were blogging. Right. Not only were they blogging, they were blogging about stuff that I couldn't get in a textbook. Right. They were also- Fred Wilson's blog, a VC. A VC. Uh-huh. And Brad Feld, Feld.com, and Roger Ehrenberg at the time. And there was like- What was Ehrenberg's? Uh, blog? I event, uh, information arbitrage. Uh huh. And he was a Wall Paul Street Kedrosky's guy. Paul Kudrowski another Paul one. Paul Kudrowski was a great writer. You, um, and obviously I had stock this. Now I have hundreds of writers. And then, um, you know, they just gave this stuff away. Right. And they owned their domain. So there wasn't any problems. Like you wrote on Fred's blog, you had to go to Fred's blog. He linked to other people. Mm -hmm. They picked up the phone. Everybody was moving fast. It was just organic. Get the speed going. And so it was just a miracle. And what we focused on was good people and big ideas because you could glob onto Facebook and Twitter. So that, and that question, attracted. So how did you become a pre-IPO investor in stocks like Facebook and Twitter? So at Twitter, Fred because of Wall Street, he wrote the first, they led the first $3 million round on to Twitter, Twitter. Wow. at a 17 million valuation. Now think Jeez. about that, right? Like today wow. that seems normal. Back then I was, just, Wall Street was like a 400K valuation. I was doing deals one on two, 600 grand on 1 million. Like founders were giving up 40% of their business. Right. We were coming out of like a hard time. Like these kids today, but <laughs> back then, it was like you're giving up meaty chunks of the business. Mm -hmm. So things had to move very fast. But really, you were betting on people. It wasn't mm -hmm. so much price because everything was cheap because right. you Valuation were coming out of that over. much of a difference. It didn't happen yet. Mark Andreessen said, all right, so imagine we overpaid double for Facebook. Who cares? It's a 6,000% return, percent return uh, instead of a 12,000%. What does it make a difference? It does now. At these so, levels. At these. So what happened is that story got... You know, when you say it a thousand times and the 12th kid graduating 20 years right. later says right. the same thing, it doesn't that's work. That's a different And story. that's why I flash forward today. But back then, yes. So Twitter to me. So Twitter, I had, I said, Fret, how am I going to make 20 times my money? I had my VC hat on for an right. hour and I go, Fret, 
Twitter would have to be worth half a billion dollars for me right. to make worth my while. Right. So of course I passed. Now, Fred taught me a lesson there. And he said, Howard, if you love everything about the product and the team, don't hold your nose the about the press. Right. But nose. I'm Canadian. This goes back to when I said I'm conservative. You didn't believe Risk me. I just mentally couldn't do a model like these guys because social leverage hadn't been around that long. Right. The network effects were new. Right. So it was mind boggling to think that the president would tweet like Trump or that <laughs> Elon Musk would be the richest guy in the world at the time. So this so is by not the way, mention, mentioning the president tweeting, you have to look at the four years of the Trump administration. That's exactly what I thought would the happen. Golden opportunity for Twitter to turn into something. How did they blow that opportunity? That I guess that postmortem is not your expertise. You're Pre-mortem, your your much earlier stage. Well, my pre-mortem was going to Jack and Evan, visualizing that for them, and saying, "Wrap a terminal around Twitter, mm -hmm. delay the feed thirty seconds for everybody." Mm -hmm. So imagine, you know, I go to Ted Mertz, who's a friend of mine. He was Bloomberg here for twenty years. Uh, I, I, so I used him, to come I to met this him building. Lindsay in Palooza. He's the guy who He's put an unsung the, hero. He put Twitter on the terminal. So because yeah. for a lot of people, Twitter became the new tape. Correct. And they were Bloomberg was smart enough to say we have to have this in our feed. People can find out about it after the fact, and they came up with a very clever way to curate. It. Bloomberg didn't come up with the key. Howard and Ted came up. With well, the key. let me tell you. I used something. to call on Ted. I used to come in here, go to the sixth floor, wear uh -huh. a suit, <laughs> complain that you? there was no candy, right? And go, what kind of mental cases don't have candy in their in their in their hallway? As and I would, I, here, candy, yeah. was, I would call on Ted. Candy here. It was. I would call on Ted and say, Ted. I don't understand. I go, you guys are, this is a dangerous problem for you to have outside the walls, like Jurassic Park. I go, trades right. are happening, not on Wait, the terminal. Right. You can't have trades away. And so I said, one day your hedge funds are going to start screaming at you that news is breaking outside the terminal. So Ted understood all that. Right. He went and cut the deal of the century, I imagine, with yeah. Twitter. Some yeah. poor sales kid at Gnip inside Twitter comes to Bloomberg <laughs> like a, like a cub into a, a right. wolf to the lion's den. Right. And, Tries we'll to meet you Twitter's quarter. <laughs> tries to meet Twitter's quarter in 2011. Comes home with like a 30 mil. I don't know what the number is. Like a <laughs> right. 10 year Bloomberg deal. Whatever the, the deal was, I'm deal sure it was good. Time. Right. So this is me yelling at stock tweets, going, "Idiots!" Like I go, Jack. This is why I was always mad at management at Twitter. I go, "Don't sell to the one customer that who can absolutely buy you. needs the data." So right. This is where Twitter's mistake was. And Fred ag agrees with me. I would go to Fred. I go, Fred, get over to that board meeting and you tell Jack and Ev to delay the feed 30 seconds. Right. Somebody will call you and pay you a billion dollars right, to get it in feed. real time. Right. And charge that company. And that's going to be Bloomberg, Reuters, Somebody. Warren Buffett, Goldman Sachs. Somebody's they can afford that. to pay you. Right. And, and if Justin Timberlake farts at a concert, if someone reads it a minute later, it doesn't matter. Right. That's but right. if a player injures itself in sports or if the president tweets or bin Laden gets shot, right. the we futures will move. Right. And that was their business idea. They could have had 10 employees. And they blew it. Yeah. And so I always still give out that idea I for still free. don't understand why Twitter didn't or doesn't acquire Stockwitz. It's such a natural thing. It's, not, it's not even about Stockwitz. They should have bought DraftKings. They should have bought right. Robin Hood. They should have been a broker dealer. Right. They should have been a, a, a gambling. They should have made money off the transaction. They think they have this crazy idea that they're the selling town ads. Square. They're the town square. Well, they and are the, the town square. You the know what's in the business. town square is a lot of poop and a lot of crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know why you can't drink out of the Nile? Because people pee in it <laughs> yeah. for a thousand years. So, so yeah, the town square is a dirty, dirty place. So, so you end up with an, uh, a, a, a sort of area that is central to so many people's correct it's the lucky. nexus of so many industries correct and so many uh, journalists and celebrities and finance people and yeah. you know there's medical twitter and there's black twitter and there's finance twitter and there's you know i, I get dragged into um i mentioned uh, i set up a list of all the watch companies right yeah. watch twitter like you have all these communities yeah and uh, it's astonishing that nobody's figured out a way to monetize this. Because it was an open protocol. Like right. when Fred invested, he envisioned it as an open protocol. What did they do? They closed it. It's okay to close it to the people 
that can afford to pay to open right. it. Not, not, not to the regular people. Right. Charging me eight dollars for something I'd pay five grand is not good business. Right. Charging me eight dollars for something I'm not willing to pay eight dollars for is not good it's business. Terrible. Right. So that was the mistake. You have the Nile River. It's just filled with data. Right. And you decide to let everybody piss in it. Right. Not and business. that's the crazy thing is Twitter is a data source is really astonishing. Especially in an era of machine learning. Right. So this I word mean, Elon could come out okay. Having a unique data set, we're jumping around here, but having yeah. a unique data set in 2023 like StockTwits does, quadruples our value because people are doing things you can't use to get to apply our mod, your LLM or your model to real-time financial people that talk right. about stocks all day long. You have to have our data. Yeah. So let's circle back to social leverage. Yeah. Uh, we talked about what you've done on the media side. We've talked about finance side. What else does social leverage focus on? Is it just you know, finance and media, or do you look at tech and other things? So, yeah, we're investing out of our fourth fund. It's a $100 million fund. Mm -hmm. uh, we went from $6 million. And you're closed. You're done. We're right? closed, yeah. So we, we, we raised $6 million for our first fund. That mm -hmm. fund had Robinhood in it. Right. God bless. The second we'll we'll fund, talk about Robinhood yeah, next. Second segment. fund had some more Robinhood and a company called Customer and a few other great companies. Uh huh. Uh, both. How big was the second fund? Twenty, uh, just two of us, and then we brought on our third partner, Gary Bennett, who had uh -huh. sold his company to Salesforce, and we were doing a lot of enterprise and healthcare. And that's our third fund, which was forty. Right. And we we like the capital constrained model. And then our fourth fund will which will be like where we settle in at for the future is a hundred million dollar right. fund. And you're still doing very early seed stuff. We write stuff. one to two million dollar check. Uh -huh. We lead rounds. We don't have sharp elbows, meaning we don't have. To, if someone wants to put their name first, you don't they care. can put their name first. Right. It's about that, the ten that, year that, stuff. Those sort of so we like contests. to win. Who cares? Now, what's changed is social leverage has evolved because uh -huh. the markets move. Um, so I was very heavy in financial services stocks, which was a great lead gen engine. Mm -hmm. We invested in Rally Road, Road Coifin, Etoro, Robinhood, Alpaca. Uh, very finance or Y charts. Uh, you know, so oh, we, I didn't realize you were in Y charts. Yeah, first check. Huh. And oh, no so, kidding. so yeah, sixty thousand dollar check to Sean Carpenter when uh -huh. he was running Y charts, and it's a great business. Yeah, no, they sold. Yeah, uh, Chart IQ, which just sold to S and P. So we really, I covered. If you were going to build a Bloomberg terminal, right. and again, this is. Twitter screwing this up. Right. Twitter should have bought all these companies and just, just given this it stuff up, away. Right. Just given it away for 50, 100 bucks a month. Create a $200 a month Bloomberg terminal that's open. They've never, no one has ever been able to do that. Including me. Because I don't and have the capital structure. And by the way, structure. the terminal just It'll gets, still happen. There'll be a roll up post this crash. I, no, there'll be a roll you up. You think so? Well, there will be an effort. I'm not saying it'll be uh, correct. I, Why wouldn't er, you? You can buy fintech assets for 90, 90 cents off the dollar. You, you could go back over the past 20 years and every three or four years, there's a story about this is finally the end of the Bloomberg terminal. And six months later, they're at all time highs in terms of users. Sorry. Nobody has ever let, been able to do let that. Let me be clear, Barry. You cannot disrupt the didn't mean it that way. Oh, but, but I mean, that's been the intent. Stupid intent. Uh, just there's nobody, certain things you can't beat. Right. Okay. You can't beat open. Right. So I'm not going to go take on open AI. Right. I mean, I don't want well, it. It works. Right. Okay. You can't take on the bloomer. That doesn't mean rich people won't try. Right. But network effects are very powerful. Uh -huh. Okay. Centralized network effects are very powerful. The second thing that Bloomberg has is the right customer. Of course. Okay? And the third thing that Bloomberg has is a will to not lose. Right. What Bloomberg got right was aesthetics, talent, uh, not, not giving an inch. Stability. That's Stability. Rocks. When was the last and time you heard about support? Right. When was the last time you heard about the terminal going down? But the key but thing, Twitter, you know, every other week you, you were hearing about that for how long? Yeah. Early on, Twitter could have set up a customer support desk for right. 500 a month and said, call us, we'll build you lists instead of the, what, you know, they so, didn't, they didn't so want I to do the hard work. I have a behavioral finance list. I have a, um, I have everybody in my firm on a list. I see everything yeah. that everybody tweets. Yeah. Um, in case anybody that says anything, uh, non-compliant compliance tracks that also the watch list is just sort of fun. I have a car list. That's yeah. fun. Like that sort of curated lists. I still, to this day, don't understand why Twitter doesn't promote these sorts of things. They're amazing. Uh, science and technology. I have a list like that that has like 70,000 followers. I don't yeah. know how that well, grew. I'll give you my thesis. My thesis is organic growth while great is also a drug. 
and mm-hmm. it got it infected people's brains meaning hey we already won america let's go to china you know how long it took like bloomberg to open its second office i imagine 10 years right you know fast twitter and facebook and even robin hood were opening offices in china year two like no one so i'm saying organic growth was a drug that force people to grow, think that they were smarter than they were, grow faster than they were. And, oh, and by the way, there was 0% interest rate and venture capitalists were lining up to give you money. Uh, Howard, in addition to running a venture fund, Social Leverage, also uh, hosts a podcast called Panic with Friends. Mm-hmm. So I got so many questions to ask you about. First, uh, w- w- what is this podcast thing you, you talk about? Well, you start, there's, there is podcasts is a thing now a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, should I look into this? You should. So I, I, I think the podcast is popular in general because you get to have these conversations with people. Conan being a perfect example. I only right. listen to comedy podcasts, so I listen to oh, Conan. Oh, really? And Conan is well, just so talented. So he, he happens to be just quick digression, which you and I both can't help but do. When I was pitching Masters in Business um, to Bloomberg, I pitched it as uh, Mark Maron meets Charlie Rose. And yeah. Mark Maron is one of the original pot. And by the way, that's back when Charlie Rose had pants on, who nobody knows what's going on. Yeah. But Mark Maron, um, he was the first guy doing long form interviews with people in his industry. And he's a stand up and, and a, a television show producer. But it's let me bring in my friends from the world of stand-up comedy and let's dissect what makes something fun. Correct. So inspired like like Jerry's show, inspired by what you do, inspired by Conan. I started my own podcast in March 10th of 2020. So the market, the VIX was like on oh, its so way we're to 90. Not quite shut down yet. I we're think like the NBA four had days just been to canceled. shut down. Yeah. And the you know, and I'm like, people were freaking out. And right. as, a, as kind of a service to myself. And my network that I have, crazy. yeah, so and a service to the, my network to be able to talk to like Fred Wilson and, uh-huh. and Jim O'Shaughnessy and you, I said, why don't I just for the 30 days document the panic and sh- start this show called Panic with Friends, where we are a calm voice. So my first inclination with COVID was this will pass, obviously, because by the dip. Uh, uh, everybody, I yeah. think, had the it same. Maybe my best call, but it wasn't like I had some great insight. It was just, oh my God, people. like. At least we breath. could do is take a deep breath. So I had this idea we're gonna we're gonna do the opposite of panic, even though the show's called Panic with Friends, and I would mm-hmm. get my calmest friends that have been through many cycles and just chat with them about the panic. And at the time, the now the market closes. I'm doing a show a day. I have great guests. Jim O'Shaughnessy is my first guest, and uh-huh. it's just really good advice. It's like God. And then I start bringing in traders when the VIX hits 80. And I'm like, what are we buying? Oil was negative. I bring on my favorite oil trader, <laughs> and we were just like. We, if you listen to my podcast, you made fortunes because we were there and I was so proud of just being kind of not making a voice jokes, of reason, a in voice the midst of reason of saying, area. guys, you don't have to buy, but if you're not thinking about buying mm-hmm. during these weeks, you will, you may not want to ever be an investor. Let me ask that you, was the idea of the show. Let me ask you a question. Cause I had a similar experience. I'm curious as to what yours was. Mm-hmm. What sort of pushback did you get to that rational, hey, down 30% in a few weeks, buying opportunity? What, what, what did people well, say? Well, the show you? wasn't like, it was more a show of like, you know, I have a big audience, not for the podcast at the time, but I would just, I figured if people ever go back and look for about 30 days of podcasting day right. after day, I was going to put a piece of work out there that would be timeless. Now, I didn't expect to be doing the show for three more years, and it should be called Frolic with Friends right. at this point. But I was really proud of it, but we just kept going. Canute is one of my best pals. It, and- it's also, you don't realize how much fun it is to sit down with somebody. Yeah. You and I know each other for a long time. Yeah. How often do we get to sit down and BS about what we do for two hours? Yeah, It's also- It's a blast. It's not just a blast. It keeps me ahead of the curve. Uh-huh. And I talk you got to very think about people. who you're talking to. Yeah. There's some prep work that you wouldn't do otherwise. Yeah. Hey, let me look into seed investing before I sit down with Howard. Oh, look what I've learned. I yeah. mean, you, you must have those sort of experiences. It's that. Although you have a staff that does all the research. I don't so have maybe staff. I do everything other than Knut myself. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, I just love the idea 
that my daughter, my wife listen to it and they uh-huh. like it. As long as they like it, I'll keep doing it. So, so every time what, I say I quit, my wife goes, I listen while I'm hiking. I go, all right, I'll keep doing so it. So what do you, what have you learned from hosting a podcast? Well, I've learned that people are great, mm-hmm. right? I've learned obviously cause I don't watch. So TV. the opposite of what you learned from Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I learned that just, there's so many smart people. And I also learn a lot about myself in that I don't know anything. And I do love to make my guests laugh. Like part of the thing is if you can make the Freds and the Jim O'Shaughnessy's and the Barry's laugh, that is the only gift that I like, was born with uh-huh. is to probe and make them giggle or just look at themselves a little less seriously. Right. Mm-hmm. So when I see a flaw in a person, whether it's Kramer or whether it's, you know, Trump, mm-hmm. I look at like, man, these are bad life decisions. Like Jim I- could have been me. He could have, he had the center of the universe. I right. look at Jim and he went media. He could have gone venture. Right. Maybe he did do venture and he doesn't talk about it. He did okay for himself though, to be fair. I'm not saying he didn't make money. I'm saying he's slapping on makeup, but he could have been uh, Andreessen. He, he, he could have been got writing a daily, checks. He's got a daily grind yeah. that looks from the outside like it's, I hope he loves if you it. had to pick one of two lifestyles, yeah. I think Andreessen's lifestyle is a little more, less, less stressful than the lifestyle that Correct. Jim took. So I feel like I chose the other side of the road. Mm-hmm. I could have gone down the media side, but I still look at the media more like the enemy. But I also don't really? look at it like Trump and Elon Musk look like it. Right. Like they're out to get me. And I know they are out to get them and whatever. But They're I'm not, out to I don't get clicks the same... and they're out to get paid. Correct. So, you know, whenever uh, I'm going to interrupt again, because uh, I feel like. No, yeah, we're friends. Uh, I feel like we, this is a conversation, not, not a Q&A. Uh, and I apologize to those people who are expecting a Q a Q and A. Whenever I hear people talk about media bias, and a, a lot of it is just lazy, lazy journalism, yeah. and and what is extreme, what is outrageous, what is sensationalistic. How do we get the views? How do we get the clicks? It's not the sort of I, I think the the right misunderstands the left, and the left misunderstands the whole thing. Mm-hmm. It's a business and it's about generating and capturing attention, not we're pushing the left versus the right side of you. Fox News is its own animal. It has its own um, uh, origin story that, that comes from a very different place. But when you just look at media in general, yellow journalism has been around for centuries, literally centuries. Yeah, I just love the idea. I was born with the gift to laugh at myself. And that's so let's just talk a gift about, that others don't so have. So let's talk about laughing at yourself. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to insert myself even deeper into the conversation. I, I wrote a, a column in 2021 for Bloomberg, what my worst trades taught me about investing. And I mentioned, you said it's 2014. I remember it's 2015, but I wouldn't swear to it. Uh, the line I said is, Howard, that's the dumbest investment idea I ever heard. I'm omitting the F-bomb that was in the middle. You and I were talking. We were in San Francisco. I have a vivid recollection of the ferry building Mm -hmm. being behind us. We were out on the deck uh, behind where a couple of those restaurants were, and you were pitching me on this ridiculous idea for an app that's going to give away free trades to millennials on their phone. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, the world's moving to passive. Who wants free trading? Where is this going? So first, kudos to you to investing in uh, Robinhood when I was too stupid to see it. But second, how did you come across the Robin Hood opportunity and what made you so enthusiastic about it? The first of all, it was it was just E Trade two point oh. So my big uh-huh. idea, like even with Wall Strip, was C N B C on YouTube. Uh-huh. Robin Hood was just an extension of what E Trade E Trade on be. the phone. So E Trade to me If you would have pitched it to me like that, because my first gig in the business was at E Trade, I would have been all over it. But yeah, so you, it's my fault. It's I guess totally it. your fault. <laughs> so Again, I in a, was in a power position on some level because people needed stock twits to mm-hmm. spam, to get users. So we right. were a gateway to traffic, much like Twitter. Uh-huh. Okay. So, but the people that came to me were people with financial app. And because I was too wimpy to build my own brokerage. So in 2013, just like you said, VCs are not perfect. They are like moths. And at the uh-huh. time, the world of VC was enamored with disrupting Vanguard. Right. So the VC models How's that were going, all, by the way, so this is the VC. <laughs> what are they models, up to? Eight trillion. This is good, good, a, good job. I'm telling you my hack. So the VCs <laughs> were seeing the world one way. Uh-huh. I saw the world another way. So the VCs were like, we got to go after the assets under management. 
I was like, who cares? Those are worth, you know, right. a dollar. You need to get the customer. Right. And you need the, you know, so it wasn't like any genius insight. It was just all the money was trying to disrupt Vanguard and Vanguard wasn't disruptible. You couldn't build a product that was 20 right. times better than Vanguard. Right. Whereas E-Trade, right. they were spending billions on advertising. So Great so advertising, this, but expensive advertising. So at the time in 2013, you could look through the financial statements of Schwab and TD public statements, and they were spending $150 for a customer acquisition. Uh -huh. So this is the math that, that I apply. We could acquire them for next to nothing. How about zero and less than zero, right? <laughs> Meaning I show my friend my free trade on my phone. He right. didn't see a TV commercial. So what does that cost you? 20, less than one. Bucks? Because one, lead, one customer led to 10. So it was right. like Uber growth. But you're giving them a free trade. You're giving them a free share of stock. Understand that. When but I what invested, is that, 20 bucks, 30 bucks? Not you even. You can't think like that as a seed investor. You can now mm -hmm. that interest rates are 5%. But, but if, at they're the time, if Schwab is spending a buck fifty per client and you're spending one share of a $5 stock, your cost of acquisition is $5. It's meaningless. Who cares? Right. So at worst, it was $5. Mm -hmm. But at best, it was still negative because that person told five other people. Right. You got to understand how that type of networking works, Viral, which is organic right. growth. So it was Snapchat, but with trading. So think about this. Do the math. If I acquire a million users and I'm at Schwab, and I did that for $10, you'd be CEO of the company. Bring me the kid that got me a million users without a TV ad, right? right? Now, all your, all your workers would try and kill you because they'd be, slow down, dude. You're, you're not supposed to work that hard. But this was my idea. It was like, if you can acquire a million users at zero, you're worth $150 million. Yep. So if I invest at an $8 million valuation, let me put up the calculator, I'm up 19 times my money in an ARB trade. So it was just an ARB idea. And again, that I you, had. you should have explained that to me. Well, at the time, I probably had gas from something I had eaten <laughs> in San Francisco. <laughs> and I had other things on my mind. No, but the idea then was. It was very hard for other people to see that because they were looking for a business model. Well, now that you've explained it, it's easy to see. And so what I didn't get right, luckily for me, again, a lot of this is luck. I didn't expect it to be 30 billion. You right. know, so we did sell some along the way. And that was the beauty of, of this market. The markets have become, they're illiquid a little bit right now, but there became liquidity in the private market. Sure. Which is Tons. what I also helped build by investing in AngelList and other uh -huh. things. So I was just part of that whole generation, which was fun, which created liquidity in the system. So how early were you in Robinhood? We were the first check. You were literally the first check. Yeah. They go public for $35 billion. That, that's got to put a few jingles yeah, in your we're pocket. Yeah, we're, we're on a few lists for our fund returns. So, yes, so you've, you, you're up. selling a little bit along the way, Yeah, but it's got to be a, a, a 100x plus, right? Yeah. I know you can't disclose that, but yeah, well it, it's over. huge. So now you're in a very different situation instead of thinking about- Yeah, now you pay me to come on the podcast. R right, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but, but for other people, we have, we have clients who've sold businesses. We have other people who've had these giant windfalls. Suddenly, it's a very different calculus. You're saying, all right, I'm no longer worrying about multiplying this. How do I go about protecting this giant pool of capital? And how do I not get killed tax-wise? So do you collar this? Do you sell it? What, what do you do when- Suddenly the bank calls and says, hey, there's a, a couple extra zeros in your bank account. Put it at the end of your, your balance. What sort of financial response do you take to that? Well, the first thing you do is I, I tell everybody is you hide it from your, your wife and kids. <laughs> right. Oh, so they don't out. know. Yeah. My kids. Uh, sorry, that Robin, Robin Hood thing didn't work yeah, out. My kids think I'm in trying to still disrupt Vanguard. <laughs> no. So the first thing you do is try and just appreciate like. You know the good fortune. So yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. you set Take up the trust. Gratitude, all that stuff is fantastic. You then, set up the trust. Uh huh. And you realize that you, you have start to moving, start lying to your children. Right. You start moving money into various mm -hmm. trusts. You, You're worth more you, dead than alive. You don't want them to know that. Yes, yes, yes. You you de incentivize move into a them house. to to detach the brake lines. We don't want that. No, to happen. I mean, there's nothing special. We, as a conservative person, as I do you I've do met, you collar the because that's a we, big chunk of money. We we distributed the stock to our LPs. So, uh -huh. so, so a lot of, so it's up to them to do what they want to do. This goes to the greed at the end of the cycle. It, yeah. You know, again, I was mentored by Fred Wilson. We've been joking. And Fred a little bit, says hit the bit. 
Fred is always because he went through 1999. Right, right. He's not. He we, went through. He's not looking to optimize. He's he, not that, looking to optimize. That exit. is the regret minimization strategy. That's right. what Fred deploys. I've made a few mistakes in my life in investing that Fred laughs at, or not laughs at, but appreciate. He says, "Hey, uh-huh. this Been is the way you that. think." Where I've optimized, over optimized for entry. Right. Okay. Fred has always said, "If everything lines up, optimize. Don't worry about it. Just entry. Optimize entry. for exit." So. I have always optimized for exit, meaning I'm never going to sell the top. Right. And, and I'm no, generally going to sell on the way up. You, you don't even get a ribbon when you top tick. I've top ticked two stocks in my life. Yeah. When I was on a trading desk, the, you, you don't ring the bell at the exchange. Yeah. No one no one gives you a plaque. It's like, oh, that was a lot of effort for nothing. Yeah. So our job is to return capital as fast as we can. And you did that. There is a there is a thing in the venture industry that's kind of a joke, which is you know IRR. Uh-huh. Well, IRR might mean something if you're returning cash. Right. And so there Internal is a, rate of return. Yes. But you're returning actual shares. So in our thing, it's dollars return. Right. So it's DPI. And so the higher your DPI, not mm-hmm. your IRR is what matters. When you have a 5 to 10 DPI and you've uh-huh. returned that much cash on cash, people return your calls. So mm-hmm. I was mentored by the people that said, focus on DPI. Uh-huh. So if you have a chance to return your cash, you, you do it. If you return your cash in 2016, we returned some cash in Robinhood in 2016 very early. Uh-huh. But say those LPs bought Bitcoin. Right. They did okay. Meaning my job isn't to manage their money. My job is when, when I entered a company, I said, if this gets to a billion, <laughs> I got to sell some. And it got to a billion. You right. can't change. Yeah, of course you can change, but I'm an early stage investor. I'm you didn't not sell a public everything. Market. You sold a little yeah. bit to take some house money off the table. Yeah. You still had a big slug waiting to see if it did any better. Yeah. So when and, when and it, it did. When it went so public, even from there, it was 35 x Oh, it's unbelievable. Now, we made the decision and our LPs agreed that we are, as soon as we can sell, we will return the shares to the LPs. Let them decide. Meaning they have their six own tax post problems. IPO. They have their other right. issues. Let us return the stock market. They want to hold it. They can hold it. For me- What, what are the rules for early invent, pre-IPO investors? Six months. So, so you basically give them pre-IPO shares. No, we give them, we have to wait legally for the shares months. to be cleaned up. Oh, okay. We clean them up uh-huh. day one. Give them their shares, their free trading. They right. can I either gotcha. hold them and give them to their kids. That's not our job. We distribute it market. And the IPO was when? 2021? Yeah, late 2021. Uh-huh. Now, a lot of people around this time started getting up their funds like Andreessen and Sequoia to be permanent capital. These right. are the signs of the top. Right. Where they're like, hey, we now have an evergreen fund that will hold these stocks. So, you know, so there Good were call. all these signs in late 2021. Late 2021. That's not a great call, man. Yeah. So, so again, you know, we consistently try and return capital. That is our job. So all told, your experience with Robinhood ended up being pretty, pretty, pretty good. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty good. We've had a few pretty. other ones, but yeah. Robinhood, it, what was fun about Robinhood is that we saw it. Other people didn't like it. And that still goes to our strategy today is when you're betting on people, you have to have domain experience, uh-huh. which we had in Robinhood. We have to get the timing right. That's right. a little bit of luck. The world was ready for an app like this. And then the pandemic certainly didn't hurt. It didn't hurt, but the execution that they had early was fantastic. Really quite fascinating. So I, I have a very vivid recollection of you being on my partner's podcast, Compound and Friends, um, Josh Brown and Michael Batnick. And I, I want to say it was like October 21. Is that about right? Yeah. And you're like the, the market screaming higher. We're up. From the lows at the end of, of uh, March 2020, the market's up 68%. For the calendar year in 2021, uh, the S&P 500's up 28%, and you couldn't have been more uncomfortable. You just said, wherever you look, signs of problems coming. What were you seeing in October 21 that made you, and not just public markets, you were talking about private market valuations, demands from founders and yeah. of startups. Like everything you said was bubblicious. So earlier in the year in April, you know, I rarely do serious interviews. And I came on Joe's podcast with Tracy and they were great. And they were like asking Odd me lots. questions. And yeah. it went, I was like, guys, I, you know, this is stupid. <laughs> and we had raised a hundred million in late 2021. Again, we went from six, as I said, to 20 to 40, to hundred. That hundred was easy. Really? So 
So and when that, 100 that gets was you, easy, it was that like, it was like Costanza. I yeah. was like the Costanza venture capital at that point. I'm like, <laughs> this has been so hard for us. We're good. But Why we're are not people that good. giving us 100? Right. What have we done to deserve this? So it was kind of like Costanzaing ourselves. And so we stopped writing checks, which is one of our oh, best decisions. So wait, hold on a second before we get to that. So you raise a hundred million. Now you mm-hmm. have a track record that's you know Robin Hood had like already said, gone people public. People just wired us money. So 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 was this? There's too much money around. People have become reckless with their capital, or is this a little uh, imposter syndrome? Hey, we're good, but we're not that good. This is a problem, or a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything plus a lot of it's now my own money. Right. And I'm conservative, and I'm right. like nothing makes sense to me, and I'm getting three minutes to decide on a deal. We're still doing business on Zoom. I'm not a Zoom guy. Right. I just like this. You, you need to see people's body language. Why can't it take and... three months to do a deal? Right. Meaning, okay, I lose Let's a deal in three it. months, but like, shouldn't I have dinner with you? Shouldn't I see if you're like, treat the staff well? Shouldn't right. I see what your co-founder looks like? I don't even know how tall you are. <laughs> so again, God bless the people that wrote checks. And my partner Gary but wrote you... a few good checks during COVID. I didn't. So, so starting in early 2021, the social leverage spigot is shut off. Almost in 2020, because March really? 2020, I start the podcast, uh-huh. and there was so much opportunity in the public markets right. that I was saying, how are you not buying these stocks? What are you worried about private markets when you can make 10x on a public stock huh. with liquidity? So I, just lost, I got lost in the public markets, and of course, you know, some cool companies got funded. But really, those first three months of COVID were like, you were like a motorcycle accident. You get up and you go, we're not dead. And so it wasn't like I was in the mood of check writing. But by like June of 2020, market was open, baby. And people were writing checks. Right. And for a couple months, I was excited. You were like, writing hey, checks. We have money. People love us. We know what we're doing. And so we wrote a few checks. But then I like by the end of the year, I'm like, this has gotten crazy. The prices were tripling. And people would be that Andreessen line. Hey, if you're going to make a thousand on your money, what's the difference if you pay triple on the opening price? Right. But that math, if you really put it in a calculator, it becomes a problem. Becomes a problem in just if you're wrong. Because now the IRR, which doesn't important to me, is important if you've invested someone's money and it takes three extra years, you're not going to beat anybody. Right. And so my job is not just about DPI. It also is about IRR because I'm going to put your money to work. The clock starts ticking and, you know, delaying an exit three years is a real thing. So the risk, I just felt the asymmetric risk. So wait, let, let, let's just talk about IRR briefly. Mm-hmm. Typical venture funds. If I commit a hundred dollars to a venture fund, a great I'll, fund, I'll get a capital call right away for I don't 20, know, 25, 25%. right. And then uh, the next January, I'll get another call for 25 bucks. Correct. And then the, so maybe over the course of three, four, five years, three to four years. So this way they can keep, they're not sitting with your cash worrying. Uh, this is just showing zero return or back when, you know, the 10 year was 2% this showing almost no return. You have to worry about your cash until they call it. Yeah. And so we, it wasn't like a lack of seeing things, you know, because e-commerce was booming after COVID and, you know, everybody was believing that, you know, the future was e-commerce and it still is. But people were locked down and behaviors were changing. People just thought that would be forever. You know, we're never going to go to it, the mall It went again. from this is temporary to everything's different. And now we see will be. the future. Right. And I didn't see the future the same way because I live in Arizona. I was hiking. Phoenix wasn't closed. There was right. no COVID Outdoors, in Phoenix. Outdoors, sure. Um, so, and what happened is this phenomenon of what took four years, the VCs were putting 100% of the money to work in 12 months, out raising Crazy. their next fund. Right. So there was a lot of FOMO. And I have to admit that the FOMO for sure caught up with me personally. Uh So as schmuck insurance against me not writing checks, I did write. And I remember Packy being on Josh's show and I was making fun of the whole thing. Packy is great. I have 25K in one of his funds and I was yelling at him. I'm like, you know, I gave you money. It didn't mean to just blow it in a casino. For people who don't know who Packy is, just give 10 seconds. He's he's just a, a really 
smart young guy. Young guy, very young. Has, launched his first fund right into the teeth of the mess. Yeah, and so he was he was really a, a fun thinker. And again, we were all locked in our house reading smart people. Right. And he had good opinions, and he was into crypto, and I'm not into crypto. So I said, I started placing personal bets with money that I had made just in case I was wrong. Right. But not my LP's money. I wasn't willing to make crazy bets with LP's money. That just goes to social. This is what we what call we the fun account. Yeah. Pull off five percent, trade away. If you blow it up, who cares? It's a small and part. So one of the insights I got from my schmuck insurance money is that no, I was a schmuck <laughs> for writing the checks. And the people that I gave the money to, God bless them, as smart as they were, I think were schmucks too. Not like bad people, just caught up in the moment of valuations don't matter. But that's why we have schmuck insurance and don't use our LPs money for these dumb ideas at times when you think this, this isn't going to work out, yeah. but I can't, I feel like I have to still be in the game. <clears throat> yeah. I feel our best work as a firm was not writing, even though we had great returns for our first funds, I feel our best work was not writing checks in 21 and 22. That's what Buffett says is, you know, unlike the public markets where you have to be invested, you could stand at the plate with the bat at your shoulder and not take a swing. Now, in Andreessen's defense, he would argue, well, you're timing the market. And so, again, I don't know if it's right or wrong, and in a way I did time the market, and so maybe I just got lucky. But my beef for the last six months, and it's quite public, my beef is with my own industry, is that they were talking out of both sides. So, so Meaning they were writing those checks and then also and saying complaint. the Fed's stupid so, and so things are talk. overvalued. And I'm like, you can't have it both ways. You so, should have been more So let's delve more into money. that. W what did you see in 2021 that you thought was egregious and ridiculous? What were the signposts that led you to say, uh, this is just out of hand? Well, not meeting founders and just assuming that you could Even write a 21 check. 21 at that point. Oh, it was worse. Because we were wide, you know, we were pretty open by 21. We were open, but the, but the money was raised and being deployed and no one was taking their time. Uh -huh. Everybody felt like, get this money Mad to work. rush. And the LPs had it, the GPs had it, the media had it. And don't get me wrong, I had it, but I didn't have it with other people's money. I had it with my own money. So we probed, right? Like I gave money to a lot of young managers just to see, because I was a young manager myself with no experience. But that was like 67 <clears throat> years ago, right? You haven't been a young manager since World War II. So. No, but you know, in 05, 06, when I started Wall Street and yeah. got the bug, I was in my, you know, I hadn't seen that much. Right. So maybe I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm the old guy. And so, as I said, to keep that social leverage going, I feel the most important part of being an angel investor, and I don't consider myself a venture capitalist, I consider myself a seed kind of more an artistic angel investor, venture, right. is you have to invest. Right. You can't just commentate. And so by investing, that helped me see how dumb I was. <laughs> and um, it's not that the other people are dumb. The, the markets are markets and they're open. Right. But um, you could see the mistakes piling up. Uh -huh. and, and now here's where we're at. So, so you put a couple of percent of your- Yeah, we've deployed 30%. Now, of a three-year-old fund. But but last year, <coughs> with your own pocket, you put a couple of percent of your net worth. Oh, in. yeah. You, what you call schmuck insurance is just, hey, I'm just keeping a toe in the water. You didn't make any big, crazy bets. No. And I got very lucky because Robin had benefited from COVID. Right. E Toro. I also was an early investor in a couple of crypto funds that had Solana. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I was a, I was a lucky uh, participator in this boom, right. which made me think maybe I have to speculate to just keep the oil going. Right. And so I made a lot of personal, luckily not like anything significant, but it taught me a lot about what the end of a cycle looks like. So and we so, just saw it. So here we are in the second quarter of 2023. Yeah. When you look around, our valuations remotely is crazy. It was a rough 2022 yeah. for both stocks, bonds, and private. Mm -hmm. what, what do you see today and what are you looking out at? It feels like, like, like I've been talking about for a year, I'm like bond boy. Mm -hmm. uh, I never thought I'd be, the, I never had owned a bond or a treasury. Hey, you could get tax-free munis now. I don't know if Arizona does a lot of muni writing. But, you know, if after tax you're getting four, four and a half percent, 
That's fantastic. You haven't seen that in decades. Yeah, four years ago, I invested in Max My Interest, my friend Gary, because he was he was aggregate. He was sending out your cash to many different accounts and getting you one percent. Right. And I was like, one percent better Ooh. than zero. So I invested in that company, and no, everybody made fun of that company. Right. And that was a company that's now important because you can get five percent on your cash uh, on the internet. Distributed through FDIC through so, many banks. So it's quarter million per bank. So you're yeah, they way, just way below out the, the limit. software years ago. Uh -huh. So so again, like it it just by participating in the markets you see things. But we are in a much different environment than I've ever seen now. because we have so much cash raised, not deployed. Right. The the money is out there. Mm -hmm. The young generation, um, you know, is very mobile. They're very smart. And, you know, it's just a confusing time because interest rates have shot up uh -huh. and we're seeing the first signs of breakage, right? We're seeing things break. Well, because... Silicon Valley broke. That that was kind of a crazy run on the bank yeah. that you could blame a handful of venture capitalists for starting. I think they were trying to do the right thing by their, uh, by, by their portfolio companies, but you know, uh, we could have just easily rode that out and. Uh, well, I don't give them that credit. You Silicon don't. Valley Bank left a black hole for nine months in yeah. the balance sheet and the internet found it. And when the internet finds it and something tips, everybody wants to take credit or not take credit for it. The mm -hmm. internet found a hole. Right. And it just imploded. Much like GameStop. Silicon Valley Bank was the opposite of GameStop. GameStop had a different type of hole. Right. There were some people Giant short. Giant short interest. And they had models. The hedge funds had models that turned out to be outdated. Right. They Meaning were, they you can never, call them wrong. They were wrong. The models were not accounting for 8 million Robin Hood people clicking a green button at the same time. And that's what created GameStop. And the same thing happened to Silicon Valley Bank keep, in reverse. Keep in mind, Silicon Valley Bank. Everybody Bank's, hit withdrawal at the same time. Silicon Valley Bank had hedges on their long... Um, treasury positions as uh, long duration, which the du long duration trade is the wrong trade while rates are going up. So the hedges offset that and they took the hedges off. They rang the bell and, and gave themselves. Gordon Gecko said it in Wall Street. They were wreckable. They yeah. left themselves wreckable. And they were wrecked. And the internet wrecked them. Huh. The GameStop hedge funds were wreckable because they didn't understand internet scale. They hadn't seen a model that had Robinhood people pushing this button. Over at and the over same and over time with leverage on short term options. So their three standard deviations was an old model. That was it. All right. I only have you for a handful of minutes before you have to go to your next meeting. Um, so let's jump to our favorite questions that we ask all our guests, starting with, uh, you know, you talked about being locked down and podcasting and streaming. What were you consuming? Uh, what's been keeping you entertained over the past couple of years? Well, I'm a media guy. I'm fascinated by like A24, all these, like they're like a great studio producing mm -hmm. stuff. So I'm a media hound. I watch everything on Hulu. I ask you, but you just gave me Daisy Jones and the Six, which so is fantastic. And Amazon, I know the guy yeah. at Amazon that did it. And I actually you met, met him at my him. event. He's a buddy of Young Mike guy. Batnick's. I bumped into right. him at he reads your our blogs. Lins and Palooza. Here's what's so fun about our business. So Celebrities crazy. read me. Yeah. And they like me. When, and I'm when like, people this is, reach this out freaks to me you. Out. So, so Ben Clymer of Hodinkee told me a story when I had him on the podcast that he's running this blog on watches. It's kind of, but not quite a business yet. And he gets an email from some guy named John Mayer. Who says, listen, I want right. to talk to you about watches. Um, I got a bunch of watches. I'd love to have stop by. So he calls the guy back, and lo and behold, it's not some guy named John Mayer. It's the rock star John Mayer yeah. who shows up at their studio, brings a back then he rolled heavy, brought a big bag of watches. Yeah. Now security is a little different. And they, they did a video together. Th yeah. That was the first talking that. watches, and that blew up and yeah. became a regular feature. So when you put yourself out there in the public, you have no idea what's going to, yeah. what's going to It's gonna magic. It. It's magic. So you ask Wait, why. By the way, which I was writing in public at your Coronado Island event is where I met the guy I would eventually hire and become my partner. And he's become a star. Josh Brown is the partner at Ritholtz Wealth Management. But for you, I never would have met Josh. Yeah. And by the way, but for me 
writing a blog, Josh never would have cared who I was. The best part of my job, and people won't believe it because I think it's money, is that you met Josh, is that we launched thousands of people on stock puts into investing, tens of thousands of people, that my f- kids' friends call me for how to do their, who to get recruited at a health tech company. Right. Placing young people in careers uh-huh. is the greatest feeling in your life. Uh, the COVID nightmare of kids working from home and Zoom was it depresses. No, it is not a. It is the biggest problem right now. But we're already off topic. In terms of media, I love it all. I don't take offense. So, Daisy to bad Jones, content. give me give me another one. Um, beef. My friends at eight twenty four. So one. I of, just added that. To, is that it's uh, very Netflix, dark right? and interesting? Yeah, and it's eight twenty four. Ali Wong is very yeah, good, and very the good other guy it. who's on it is also very good. Very good. So, I haven't watched it yet. It's so, on my in my queue. So someone who reads my blog, Ravi Nandan, is a partner at eight twenty four, which uh-huh. is like the A sixteen Z of date of media, uh-huh. big studio, and he just emailed me on my blog one day. He goes, man, I'm fascinated. You got you, sh- you know. And I'm always fascinated that smart people are reading me and, you know, long time reader, first time commenter, you get that all the time too. And it just amazes me who reads what I write. And I'm not so fascinated in trying to meet the biggest celebrities. Right. The fact that Ravi's a creator and did the Rami show and I, I'm fascinated by like media Uh because I did it like myself and I don't know. It's like, it's like, um, you know, with the, uh, wizard of Oz, when you meet the wizard, like getting no attention to, see, to the man behind getting the to see behind the curtain and yeah. realizing nothing's going on behind the curtain. It's you not have special to believe, anyway. You have to see it to believe it. Right. My CBS meeting, as stupid as it was, was to have that meeting and be in that room, you can't make it up. I picture the episode of Seinfeld where they're pitching the Seinfeld Chronicles to NBC. That's me. That's the show. What do you That's mean nothing me. happens? That's the show. Why are you watching it? It's on television. Not yet. So to, to know that I lived it, people can't take that away from me. <laughs> and to know when to meet people that create great content, and we have a documentary that you're coming to see. So to think this that I now have- This is not financial advice. Yeah, to, you can say it on the air. This is not financial advice. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, By the way, we is, had the Doge guy at Future Proof, and it's, it's like Curb Your Enthusiasm for Money. Yeah, it's so cringy watching this guy go from nothing to it's millions the greatest of dollars, story. and then you're watching him blow it up, and you as you're it screaming starts, at him you like, know what's going to happen. Yeah. You see it coming, and he is just so <laughs> oblivious to what's the freight train barreling down at him. It's very hard to take your eyes. Yeah, off the of odds it. of me making money or getting my money back are oh, well, it's five percent zero, right? So five percent. It's a labor of love. <laughs> right. that Chris Temple created this he incredible did a great, documentary. Great job. The reviews are insane. By the time this comes out, you will know that it Isn't is picked gonna... up by Tribeca Film Festival. Right, it's a Tribeca. It's so been I'm one a for one on my movies. They... <laughs> uh, I have a red cashmere suit to wear to the opening. Right. I'm going to wear, I'm gonna wear the, a gold chain with my T-score, my testosterone score. It's a new thing that I'm launching where people wear their T-score around their neck. What, what, is the, what is the launch date of This Is Financial Advice, the opening date? The Tribeca debut is in June. Oh, so you still got months to yeah. So, so, so I love media. Clearly. Let, let's talk about mentors. You mentioned Fred Wilson. Mm-hmm. Who else helped shape your career besides Fred? Or is Fred really the most significant mentor? No, obviously. I mean, again, I don't speak to him all the time, but he, he allows me to check in and ask him questions. Right. Um, a lot of my LPs are my mentors. Even though they huh. give me money, I'm there. Like I've surrounded myself, like Paul Grimberg, who's chairman of Axos Bank, and I met um, some really interesting LPs at your last event. Yeah. Um, so my LPs are my mentors, Roger Ehrenberg, uh-huh. Brad Feld, uh, people that trusted me and you know, they don't, they, they, they know that I'm weird. They, they believe in me, but they know also that I like, don't know what I'm doing. Right. And so they pick up the phone because if I call even to this them, day, do you feel like you don't know what you're doing? I, yeah. Are you really that deep into the imposter syndrome thing? Is no, that, I'm not deep into it. Like Dave Nodding and I joke about it. I'm like, I don't think it really exists. He's like, no, no, you got to talk to people who aren't sociopaths like you. It, it actually exists. Yeah. I think I'm, I think I don't have it. I just have been humbled ridiculously a few times. That's fair. That I have to be really careful. And and again, the writing market, the blog, both private and public markets, are a very humbling place. Yeah. So if I'm Elon Musk, and you have a lot to be humble about, 
yeah. is the old joke. So if Elon Musk, what bugged me about it is, is there nobody whispering in his ear that he looks like an ass? I would he hope needs... that my wife and my daughter mm -hmm. would come to me and stop me before I embarrass myself day after day. I... Now, is he embarrassed? No. So again, I'm not judging. But that's I'm just hoping mistake. that I... he should be. I'm hoping that my wife and my daughter who read my blog would say, you're full of yourself. Right. You need to tone it down. And guess that's, what? They're that's pretty the, good at telling me that. That's the importance of having some no men around you. Yeah. I, I tweet something that's a tenth as idiotic as Elon Musk, and the the tweet is barely live when Batnick comes storming into my office. Idiot, delete that. You know that you're like a junior partner here, and I'm the <laughs> chairman. My I don't care. That's the dumbest thing you ever tweeted. Take that down. Okay. I don't even think about it anymore. Maybe that was my response five years ago. Now, Batnick says, that's a bad tweet. I'm like, okay, I don't even think about it. It's automatic. What Elon Musk needs is a Batnick. If he had a Batnick, he wouldn't have pissed $44 billion away. Well, on. he has people cheering him on. Yeah, he has the opposite. He yeah. has anti-Batniks. He has yeah. people Break indulging the his worst instincts yeah. rather than saying, that's a lot of money for a really crappy property that nobody's ever been able to monetize and its business model is awful and you're running two or more other companies, maybe you should just keep tweeting for free. Nobody said that to him. Yeah, I wrote about this recently. We, we wanted to disrupt television and we got television times 100. So we wanted, <laughs> we wanted to get rid of Jim Cramer. We got 20 Jim Cramers right. with more power than we thought That's that right. they would have. Jim Cramer is lightweight compared to the... Moss, David Sachs, and laughing the Elon that, yeah. Moss, the right. Peter Thiels. You just don't know if they're happy about the system blowing up. You can't tell if they like it. And I guess we shouldn't like it. I love the system. I don't think it's perfect. I love that things work. They're not working great, mm -hmm. but relative to everywhere else, it's a miracle. Chamath turned his business into a family office. I think he's happy with it. I can't, I can't tell you about everybody else. Um, some of these guys, I think, if their daddies hugged them when they were younger, we could have avoided a lot. Yeah, I of, don't know a lot of agita. I don't want to play pop psychologist to any. No one hugged me, and I'm right? okay. And you worked out all right. That's yeah. right. I did have Jack one time saying on Twitter to one of my tweets that I needed a hug, and I think one of the proudest father moments I had was that my daughter came right into the thread and said he got plenty of hugs. <laughs> So that's I mean, awesome. When your daughter is defending you to Jack Against Dorsey <laughs> on Twitter and he disappears from the conversation. He just never responded. Can't respond. My daughter destroyed him. <laughs> he didn't know what he was walking into. This that's was hilarious. my problem with Twitter. Yeah. I go, Jack, you don't know how to use your own product. My 24 right. year old daughter just shamed you off your own product. <laughs> That's un. That, that's she's a great girl. Like she's great. She lives Upper East, so I'm really proud. Oh, she's here in the. One of the proudest things I have. Yeah. So one of the proudest things I have is my daughter lives in New York. She's uh -huh. living the entrepreneur as a father who's an entrepreneur, an American, can it, born Canada, but American to see to have your daughter live in New York, the entrepreneurial city in America. Uh -huh. This is you, that's good daddying. You 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 did and she job. likes New York, which there you, you want your kid to like New York. You, you, it's not for everybody. I, agree, I happen to but love you have the to city, try it. but right, yeah, or any large city like Chicago or Miami. Well, Chicago's or not Francisco. the same city. New York is closest to being the same city. Chicago yeah. ain't the same city. Huh, that's really interesting. Let's talk about books. What are some of your favorites? What are you reading right now? I have not read a lot of books in the last twenty years. No kidding. Three books that define that I still remember vividly, and as Agassiz book, the, open, yeah. The Shoe Dog book, which is going to spawn a hundred movies, obviously just his first movie. Yeah, that was Air. that was good. I uh, it was good. I don't I don't know <laughs> if I'd call it great, but it was certainly to a me fun it was read. a business book. Yes. Meaning, if you're an internet entrepreneur and haven't read Shoe Dog, you're not going to be a good entrepreneur. To see that he went ten years before he got to ten million in sales. These kids today, with their global growth right. in the first week, so no Shoe Dog was great. Reminiscent of Stock Operator was great. Edward but there's just not that many books that I get. Through. Hey, man, that's that's three solid books right yeah. there. You, you're OK with it. Our last two questions. What sort of advice would you give a recent college grad interested in a career in, in either seed investing or venture capital? Well, first, be nice to your parents because you're going to need capital. Right. right. And, and the first thing is write. 
stop thinking about who's reading it. You know, we're an investor in Beehive, which is like a newsletter uh -huh. writing product, or whether you're going to do it on Mirror, or wherever you're going to, or Twitter, wherever it's easiest. Start writing and stop worrying about who's reading it. Write what you want to write about. And that's how you build one. domain experience. You right. have to have be passionate about something because that will help you see around corners. Whether if my son is golf for my daughter, she's not quite sure yet. It's New York and it's like operations. If you don't do it and do it, you can't possibly know that you're going to be good at it. Uh -huh. So the faster you figure out something that you want to do, and I think the easiest thing to do is write, um, that's something that people should do. The second most important thing is forget about the job title. Go work at a company mm -hmm. whose product is flying off the shelf. So when we were kids, you and I, and I was a stockbroker and whatever your first job was, you were a lawyer. Our job was to just follow directions, right? Right. Like our job was simply, you get out there and you follow this rule book and you make 200 calls a day and so and so and so and 200. so. You know what I mean? Like, pick yeah. up that phone. We've seen the movies. Wait a minute. What's the question? You used to get a grid. How many do an X every call? And... I forget the question. Yeah. What's the question? So, so what advice would you give these yeah. kids who want to start out in seed or VC investing? So, so, so the thing is, you've got to go and not worry about the title. So that if you're not worried about the title, go work at a company whose product is flying off the shelf. Don't go push a rock up a hill. So mm -hmm. forget about the title and what your pay is. You are going to see things that you won't see anywhere else if you work at a company whose product is flying off the shelf. There'll be so much work to do. There'll be, you won't have to hide out. You can shine because there are holes to fill. So the biggest mistake young people make is they want to just get a job for a certain salary and work at a bank. Go, like whether it's Manscaped, one of our companies, or whether it was the messaging app, whatever is flying off the shelf, get yourself in that room. Take a maintenance job. Take an office manager job, but just get in the door. Huh. And our final question, what do you know about the world of seed investing that you wish you knew 75 years ago when you were first getting started? But, you know, luckily I think it's such a new thing that I don't know if there was anything. I think that the thing that I got lucky more than no is it was just the right time, right? Like the, there was people like Fred and Roger writing and Brad Feld writing. So what do I wish I knew? Uh, and I don't mean buy Apple at $2. I mean, yeah. what would have been useful earlier in your career that you now feel is a bit of hard won wisdom? I think I got lucky because going to the market first in uh -huh. hindsight and, and seeing how markets crash and really seeing like how a cycle works before I got into angel investing was actually lucky. So I would say to those people who think they want to be seed investors is open a Robinhood account. Uh -huh. Even if it's one, sh like learn what it feels like to lose money. Learn <laughs> what it feels like to both make money and feel euphoric right. and feel like you're an idiot. And that will get you a feel. And now, you know, obviously you can go to Vegas or go on DraftKings and get the same thing, but they're not, but those are very much not positive expectancy type things like right. the stock market. Whereas the market is. Yeah. Uh, Howard, thanks so much for being so generous with our, your time. Really, th this has been a delight. We have been speaking with Howard Lindzen. He is the co-founder of StockTwits, the founder of Wall Strip, the managing partner and founder of Social Leverage, uh, a pre-IPO investor in Facebook, in Twitter, and the really the first check into Robinhood. Is that yeah. right? That, that's amazing. Um, if you enjoy this conversation, well, be sure and check out any of our previous 496 discussions we've had over the past eight and a half years. You can find those at YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Sign up for my daily reading list at Ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ritholtz. Follow all of the fine family of Bloomberg podcasts at podcasts. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack staff that helps me put these conversations together each week. Samantha Danzinger is my audio engineer. Harris Wald is my producer. Atika Valbrun is my project manager. Sean Russo is my researcher. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.